first former opponent on my pod as well. Yeah. I didn't give you the respect because in my head, I'm going to knock you out at one point until I beat you up. It was um, <laughs> it was a bit of a pasting, wasn't it, for me? Yeah, it I got it with fe- everything, fe- including pacing. the yeah, kitchen yeah. sink. Like, you just couldn't miss, could you? No, I couldn't. No, like, no. literally <laughs> couldn't miss. David Hay said to me that he came into your change room before the fight and you said to him, this is my Audley Harrison fight. I did say it to him. I didn't think it. I was waiting to see his response. <laughs> right, right, and right, His right. response was, he looked at me funny, then he swallowed. And I thought, this ain't my old Harrison fight. <laughs> <laughs> he, knows, he knows George Groves can fight. And if he says something, what I was doing is I was resp- responding emotionally, like angry, pissed off, angry, hated him, wanted to knock his head off. Like, yeah. ridiculous. Like, why did I hate him so much? He did piss me off, that. Yeah, you I was were like, good, though. You did a, And he's such a good troll. Oh, no. Yeah, proper troll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember feeling pressure in Wembley Stadium. From you put yourself fight. under a bit of pressure, though. You came in on the top of a double-decker yeah. boss. But that shot that I knocked you out with in front of 80,000 at Wembley, when I landed on the mandible section of the cranium, rendering you unconscious yeah. momentarily. It came from nowhere. Jake Paul's a clown. He's such a Oof. fucking idiot. Disgrace this list. You put his <laughs> name on it, in fact. It's been nerve wracking, Dex. We're on camera today. It's brand new for us. Normally it's we... audio only. No, but we've gone all in because we have got one hell of a guest. Yeah. Big hitter. Big hitter. One of the biggest hitters on the list. I can I probably say biggest. He's a... he, he, well, yeah, no, he's <laughs> definitely a big hitter. Literally. Yeah, you could literally. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Of course. He's none other than first former opponent on my pod as well. Yeah. It's Carl the Cobra Club. Frotch. Mm. I'm Carl. glad you got the Cobra in there. The cobra. It's the Cobra. I was waiting for the Cobra. Mm. <laughs> he's How you the doing? Cobra. All right. We're good. Thanks for coming in, Carl. It's a pleasure see... to be here. It, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I fuck knows where the cameras are. There's one there. There's one there. I, didn't, I mean, well, there's a few cameras. I thought there was a camera set up because when I walked in the studio, I tripped up the step on the way and I thought they definitely 250 quid. And they, and they didn't do me on <laughs> the social. So like, yeah. You need to get on that. Put a camera there. Yeah. Get everyone, because everyone's going to trip over that. Uh, yeah, it's not my studio, but the, maybe maybe it will. It is now, mate. Suffice. There's yeah. a name up there. Okay, there we go. Carl, thank you for coming on the show, mate. So, George Groves Boxing Club podcast. So now you are officially part of the club. Thank you very much for joining the club. I had a little listen last week. Shane McGuigan was yes. on oh, yeah. pads. Uh, that was the first episode. Talking absolute was bollocks. So. I was like snoring, thinking, what's... <laughs> really? Yeah, absolutely. Who Shane was? No, what, I, like, what? I like Shane, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I do like Shane. I like his old man's a legend. Yeah. Um, no, he's, he's a good pad man, so don't let anyone get, take that the wrong way. But I was listening there in the car, I thought, I'm going on George's podcast... So, um, boxing club. So, um, I thought I'd better have a listen. There's an episode with Barry as well. Get on that. Oh, is there? It's a great one. Yeah, I definitely yeah. have a listen to if that. You're not, if you're yeah. a fan of his. In between Jordan it. Peterson and um, a few others. Yeah. He's so. all right, Jordan Peterson, but this is actually better. Yeah. It's actually better. So, what's listen. the theme then, George? So, the theme, I, I mean, there's so many themes that we could go with with Carl. Mm. And me and Carl have had our own themes. We're on tour at the moment, aren't we? We've got a show That's later right. on this evening. Yeah. But, Carl, what I think is fascinating that no one's really got to the bottom of yet, which we. It sort of came out on last week's show, me and you, is preparing for the last fight, right? Because for you, it was a big last fight. For me, it was obviously a huge fight. It was the first, because the first time it's Wembley Stadium, it's the biggest fight in post-war British history. So it's the first, but for you, it was the last. And you've let slip now that you knew it was your last fight and that lots of things had to chop and change you you made them changes maybe consciously maybe unconsciously and I'd like to have a little dig into them and you know you elaborate on some of them things I think it'd be fascinating for people to hear mm. you up for that? absolutely yeah because we we try and get a theme for each episode and like we said there's lots to go out especially with you two but the last fight like you you knew and I don't remember in the build up to that fight you letting that on really no did I, didn't, I didn't announce it like I'm retiring after no this. you didn't no, did didn't. you no it just it's in my own head was it and even Robert Kraken probably didn't fully know he kind of got the inklings as I was asking questions and what if this and what if that and what's next after this if we did box you know what's the point and all you know because I'd made quite a lot of money by that time after the Mikel Kessler fight the rematch um, which was at the O2 in London I'd, after winning that fight I felt like like my job was done in the sport Maybe how you felt after you won your world title. Yeah. But I felt like I've, I've had the rematch, I've avenged that loss. All right, I lost to Ward, but I beat Butane, such a great fight against someone and no one thought I could win. And then I had that Mark Time fight, and then it was Kessler. I boxed um, Yusuf Mack between, between Kessler and... That was in Nottingham, uh, wasn't it? That was in Nottingham, yeah. yeah. That was like a gimme. My Last first one. gimme. Yeah. yeah, like Mark Time. Um, easy fight, really. He was ranked to the top 10 with a light of weight. He'd just come off a good fight with Tavoris, a guy called Tavoris Cloud. But anyway, that was... 
by my own admission, an easy fight for me. Body shot, folded him off like a deck chair, as Ricky Allen would say. <laughs> and um, it was just easy. I got paid. I thought, oh, that's nice to have a nice easy night's work. Because I had 14 more titles. Yeah, you, I mean, you didn't have it easy all the time. You yeah. used to like to have a, make it difficult for yourself. What yeah? about not having it easy? I've got the best resume back to back monsters in British <laughs> boxing. Mm. 14 world title fights against monsters, including you. Yeah, so you went, you went like, to, to told Deck, you fought Pascal in your first world title fight, yeah? Mm. That was in 2008. Correct. I think I'd, ter- I'd signed pro, but hadn't had my pro fight yet. Mm. So I, I'm, I haven't even, I'm still an amateur when you had your first world title fight, yeah. right the way up mm. until your last world title fight. Which is, which is amazing. And once you, Fought for a world title, you never went back, did you? It was world title after world title, world yeah, title whether you yeah. won or lost. Exactly, you know? yeah, because I was in the Super Six. So it was um, it was Jean Pascal, who went on to be a great fighter, and sent him a 40th birthday message last week. Then it was first defence against Jermaine Taylor in America. Then it was Super Six World Boxing Classic, similar to your Super Series. And mm. So that was um, Andre Durrell, un- unbeaten, fast American, horrible fighter, fast dance. Um, I think De Gale, I've him, yeah. your old pal fought him, didn't he? Yep. Fast and skillful and just the matrix. But he got no battle. I stuck it on him because I thought he's too quick for me, he's too skillful, he's going to outbox me and run rings around me. But not in Nottingham. I'm going to go for him, I'm going to walk towards him and try and get hold of him. And he just ran. He had a little go and he was too busy running. I mean, it was a split decision, win for me, close fight. Always going to be with someone like that, very skillful and fast. But I just mm. sort of manhandled him. And got him out of there and won and just thought, right, fuck off. I don't need to look at you again now. You know what I mean? <laughs> but there was a chance if he'd have won the next one, we could meet again. But I thought I wouldn't be finding him again. Um, but I got the I got the worst of those. I got I got Andre Ward at the end of the tournament. But um, no, it was it was um, it was Pascal, um, Jermaine Taylor. Then it was Durrell. Then Mikel Kessler. Then Arthur Abraham. All top fighters. Then Johnson, the old boy, you you beat up. You beat him up when he was well past his best. I softened him up. <laughs> I probably royally softened him up for you. You know, I had a kind of life and death of him. You know, I bought a ticket in that fight. I beat him like 12 months later. I fought later. him just after he knocked out Roy Jones Jr. Sounds <laughs> <better. laughs> He was flying, he was. And then... Um, and then it was. Where um, was that fight? That was in America. Atlantic City. Atlantic City yeah. you, did you travel well? Mm, I did. You, I don't did you mind box it. well? I mean, Jermaine Taylor was. No, Atlantic I was in City, New York. I've just talked to the guy, one of the producers from New York, about flagging cabs every day to Gleason's Gym and Trinity Gym. It was a good experience. Mm. But I was there for five, six weeks, and then I went back for the ward fight for another six weeks. And it was like Groundhog Day. Mm. Yeah, I was hating life. Yeah, because um, for Ward you were in New York and then went up to Atlantic City for the presses and stuff. Yeah, that's right. The fight, yeah, yeah, Atlantic City. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was just I didn't enjoy it. Didn't enjoy the second visit to New York. I was bored and I thought I've got Andre Ward waiting for me as well. I knew it was going to be a tough, tricky, old, horrible fight. Mm. And I knew he can move and he don't let you get hold of him and he just holds on to you. Then gets he makes room, jabs you because he's quick and then he ties you up. I just thought this is going to be a nightmare. It, no matter what me and Rob spoke about and the tactics, I just thought this is going to be a tough one to win. And I, I, was, I was in a bad mood as well. I was sulking on the night. My brother was there, pissed out his brains, talking shit in the changing rooms, having a go at his trainer. What's his trainer's name? Uh, the boy, what, Virgil Hunter. Yeah, Virgil Hunter, yeah. Oh, what did he say to Virgil? He just said, what are you looking at? He was looking at his gloves, leaves his gloves alone. He was like, I want to check his bandages, brother. Leave me alone. He's like, man, fucking tell me to leave you alone. I'll put Who would you send in to check <laughs> Ward's bandages? I don't even think we ever bothered. Maybe Selsa. Oh, mother. The Selsa yeah. machine was in there checking yeah. him. He does a thorough job as well. Do you think, yeah? I can imagine he'd... he'd I mean, he's such a lovely guy. You he know, probably knows. Yeah. He would just... He would befriend him. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, fine. Whatever. Not even looking. He'll come back in and lie to me and say, oh, he's made a right bad shot of You're going to be fine tonight. Yeah. Gonna, his hands look terrible, just to make you feel better. No, I liked having um, Seltz around. It's good. Yeah, good, yeah, good so the Ward fight was the last one in the Super 6. And so, yeah, then was, you came back against Butte. That's right, yeah. yeah. So, so back in we've gone off on a tangent here, haven't we, about, about no, my resume? I've quoted how good my resume is, and I've got to back it up. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the Royal then the rematch. Sorry, let's go back to the Super Six. Um, it was Kester Abraham, lost to Kester, beat Abraham back for my WBC title. And that was nice to get one back on the Sowlands because you've got Kala Sowland doing that mad shake he does when he gets in the ring. <laughs> Another um, episode, another guest on the, I on the thinking, pod. I've got to beat him. I'm not bothered about beating um, Arthur Abraham. I want to beat Sal. <laughs> <laughs> so Abraham got battered because of Sal and because I just hammered Abraham. He wasn't tall enough and he didn't have the speed. I just kept him at range and hammered him. I mean, I really beat him. My hands were really sore from punching him in the face for 12 rounds. He's a tough man, he is. Yeah, he's um, a tough man. And then my next fight was, um, was it Johnson or Ward? I think it was Johnson. Johnson Ward, and then Andre Ward in the final. And then come back to the UK on British soil, thinking, lovely, I've got a knife fight and win a world title. So I bought, I thought, fought. Um, Lucian Butte, first fight back. Um, 
And after that, it was Yusuf Mack, first Mark time fight, um, Mikel Kessler rematch. And I'd had enough. I was like, I got Kessler. I was nervous for that fight. I know Kessler can fight. If you're fighting Kessler, George, you're going in that fight nervous, aren't you? you yeah, know it's a in... real fight. You know he's going to be super fit. He's like he's been he's been about the block. You know he's it's, 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 he's hard. It's a tough fight. My first fight with him was tough in Hearn in Denmark, and that was like a oh, close fight. Could have gone either way. I thought, but on the night, looking back at it as well, and how I felt on the night, I thought I just got to be there. Was that the Ash Cloud one as well? Yeah, mm. well, we we flew over a little bit later. I took a little bit of weight off, but I was still fit for twelve rounds. I was still strong. And, Give me a hell of a fight. We, we had a great, great, great match. So after I had that rematch at the O2 on Sky Sports pay per view, I earned a few million quid. It was like I've avenged a defeat. I've got plenty of money now to last me the rest of my life because I'm quite astute with my money. Um, I'm into property as well, quite big, and that always helps when you're um, putting your, your money down into property because um, it lasts. It doubles. It works for you. You know what I mean? I recommend any young fighter that makes any money try and get into property before the Matrix tells you you can't. Because apparently you'll own nothing and you'll be happy one day. So, but that's another po- that's another podcast. <laughs> that's another I think podcast. We need another episode for that. So yeah. after um, after the Butte fight, Yusuf Mack, and then it was all about the Mikel Kester rematch. And I was nervous, and I was thinking this guy's tough for twelve. I gave him everything I had in the first fight, and he was still stood there licking his lips, coming back for more. But I wasn't quite as fit as I could have been with the ash cloud and all them little final complications. So that's why I was building up my confidence, thinking no, I'm fit and strong now. I'll do him, it's in Nottingham. And he's slowed down a little bit as old Kessler. He's, he was, I mean, he's younger than me, but still getting towards the end of his career. And we just had a 12-round humdinger at the O2 mm. on Sky Sports pay-per-view, and it was just great. And I felt like, this is it. I've done everything I need to do, like did, literally. In the in the build-up to that fight then, did you think that could be a last one? And did um, you think a defeat would I, you, I would didn't feel enough? like retiring around that time. And I didn't go into that fight thinking, oh, this might be my last. I was just thinking, this is a fight I've got to win. So I used to have this tunnel vision mindset even though I lost to Kessler in the first one it was really close tight points decision loss and even though I lost to Andre Ward it was just a shit fight against someone who I felt like I'd been pickpocketed like I didn't land many shots because my hands weren't hurting didn't really have any marks on my face because I didn't really get hit with much and I just I was just like oh, is that it really it, was, it didn't feel like a loss it just felt like a good I'm out of the Super 6 now I hit, that's that chapter in my life done now I can move on so I got the Butte fight and became IBF world champion again I'm like right I'm back in business let's go and then when I got the Kessler fight, the rematch, the WBA title, I was like two or three times world champion, beat Kessler, made a few million quid and thought, how do me now? I'm 35 years old. My injury is a bit sore, my elbows, my hands, my back sore, Achilles tendon. Can't breathe out my nose very well, even though it was a good old nose. Good hooter it was. <laughs> um, it didn't work. You had trouble breathing, didn't you? Yeah, You've I always had breathe, trouble breathing. But, yeah, you... <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. But yeah, it was the it was the Kester one. And I just felt like that was the end for me. Not the end after. I was like, I'm well, not you're re- flying high off I'm the not Kester. Retiring. Yeah, so you've come, you've 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 beat Boutte, and now, and I'm sure you won't mind me saying, like. You, you're on Sky now, and you're getting much more love. Like mm. you know, you're becoming a bit more of a face. Yeah. Like you, you, you're leading from the front for British boxing. Yeah. And then the Kessler fight, as you say, when they brought back pay per view. So there was, when Sky are doing pay per view, they're going to go all in. They're going to throw everything in the kitchen sink at and it. They you did. Know? It was and the first pay per view back though. Build himself as well at the yeah. time. It was the first pay per view back since all the Harrison and was it David Hay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Hay. Hay Klitschko was the last one. Was so I'm pretty sure that was pay per view, mm. and that was after Audley. But Audley didn't, he'd done great numbers, but there was people were happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. And then Klitschko probably done really good numbers as well. But again, people were a bit disappointed. But after all it. the complaints and that Sky so was like, then oh, Sky, sacking off pay per view. I mean, so was it, was it after the Kessler rematch, the victory then, that George got called as a mandatory? Yeah, well, it was after Straight that fight, away. and I thought, right, I'm World Champ again. Well, two time we got the IBF on the WBA, beat Kessler, so avenge that loss. Sky Sports pay per view. So yeah, I'm thinking. I could have been thinking to myself, right, I've got a real good future now, I can make some good money, but I wasn't. I was thinking to myself, I've about had enough now. I literally, I signed up for a dance show. I don't dance. I can't dance. <laughs> I, tell people, I tell people I can dance on a Friday night when me and George are having a tour. I tell them about it when, he, when he's taking the piss out of me for doing a dance show with my wife. <laughs> but I'm signed up for a dance show because it's like the celebrity thing after boxing. Are I'm, you on, I'm, I'm well on ITV. Well. Yeah, I've got kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rocco was young when I was doing that, but yeah. I didn't have my daughters now. Um, I've got 
a boy, twelve year old boy, a nine year old, and two um, a nine year old and a seven year old mm. girl. So a boy, girl, girl, twelve, nine, and seven. I've had to really think about that. <laughs> In case Rachel's listening. I feel, yeah. like, I I feel got... like your missus was pregnant with your daughter around the time of the rematch or around that. Well, that's nine years ago, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she would have been. Yeah. So you... your life's changing a bit at that point. Like, yeah, you're... it's turning around. I've got, I've got my son like, who's walking around now and chatting to me. And so I've got this little life that I never used to have when I was a real like, ruthless fighter. And I'm becoming more civilised. And I'm on a TV show with my wife dancing on a Saturday night, you know, television show. And you get you feel a bit celebrity lifestyle kicking in. You feel like I'm winding down now. The tools are being put in the box, ready to go in the van. So you, you want to go home and put your feet and put your feet up. But George was mandatory for the IBF, and um, Eddie Hearn phoned me up and said, "You're fighting George." I was a bit like, "Hang on a minute, where's all this come from? What's going on?" I thought I was having a big fight in Vegas, or maybe someone like Chavez Junior was talked about. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And I just thought it'd be nice to sign off now with a big fight. I feel like I'm going back now to British level. I sparred George and I didn't, I didn't give George the respect he deserved. He did deserve respect because he completely punched. I sparred loads of rounds of him. I knew it was awkward, hard work, fast hands, punches hard. It's like good ring craft. And I'm thinking, it's not really a big name. I want a big name. Let's have one more big payday then retire. You know, maybe that's in the back of my head. But um, no, George was mandatory. I can't remember what the question was. We're talking about my resume. Yeah, that was we? it. No, no, because I remember, well, <laughs> just briefly before that, do you remember this when Eddie said that George Groves fighting you would be medically unsafe. Can you remember that quote? Oh, yeah, that was his quote. Yeah, that was his quote. Was that Eddie's quote? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he said it wouldn't be right. Yeah, he said it wouldn't be right. Medically yeah. unsafe. Yeah, Did, no, that's, aware, at the time, <laughs> look, I forgot that one. Were you yeah. aware at the time, though, that there was this idea that you weren't ready for Carl and this was like a big leap and then it was pay per view and you're like, but Carl, you know, Carl should be going to Vegas and doing this and that. What, George Groves, what, why are we paying to see this? Can you remember yeah, that? No, were you I aware think, of that narrative? I, I remember people saying to me, like, oh, um, you're not ready. Do you know what I mean? You're essentially not ready. But it's like, when are you ever ready to make that last jump? Like, if, uh, you know, you say that, it, unless you're old and then they're like, well, he's now or never. If I think I was only 24 at the time. So I'm still young. So you're like, I mean, the magnitude of the fights, both fights, um, I'm pretty young, really, when I think about it. But, I didn't turn pro till I was 25. So when yeah, you think of that, he's yeah. 24 fighting me for a world title. It's yeah. amazing. But no. I've been I've been pro for four years. At yeah, that point. So, you know, I, And I'd been involved in a couple of big fights and I'd been on the road I'd, and I'd experienced the ups and downs. I'd gone from thinking, you know, I beat the gal and thinking, wow, I'm going to have a world title shot in the next year and I'm going to be earning mega money to, like, back earning nothing. Um, I remember having a... A conversation. I was flying out to Spa Kessler <laughs> um, for uh, when he was preparing to, to uh, fight Carl in his rematch. So George Groves was sparring my opponent, Mikel Kessler, in my rematch against Kessler. Just, soften, for, just for clarity, soften him up like he softened yeah. uh, Glenn Johnson up. I softened up Kessler for him, uh, and it worked. <laughs> no thanks, no thanks from him. But uh, no. So and I remember saying to Adam Booth, who was my trainer at the time, saying like, I've got a little flat. At the time, I was like, if I can pay off this flat and have one more, that's me. I'll, I'll be happy with that. And him, and he was just being like, I will see. He wants to make some money out of me. I'm like, nah, you know, that's that's not enough. And I was like, well, I, I've never wanted to like set a low ceiling. Of course, I wanted to be rich and famous and have mansions and flash cars and everything. But also, I've been pro now for four plus years. And when's it coming? Like, when's it coming? But this fight this fight sold you know mm. um i didn't know it was it was right there and then thinking about it like retrospectively now with hindsight no doubt it was the business side of it I, I, eddie hearn looking for an opponent for, for carl he probably doesn't back him back to take carl to fight chavez he'll have to work with other promoters or he'll have to go to the states when he wasn't in the states then it's like, nothing well, like a domestic dust up as well from a promoter's point of view so it, it makes always sense sells it. sky sky always love it it always sells you know um and i'm unbeaten you know i'm a prospect I've, I've i've done everything that's asked me i'm world ranked so and now this is a mandatory so it Essentially, it's easy to make the fight as well. So, should point out mandatory for those listeners who don't know means the the sanctioning body, the IBF, of which you were the belt holder, said that you are the number one contender for that belt. Mm. But you were number six in the rankings. Is that right? They yeah. went down the rank. There's rankings. Literally, rankings went down. George Groves available. That's the fight. I think um, Eddie Hearn worked a bit of magic with, um, <laughs> with Leslie at the IBF. Yeah. Is it Leslie Tucker? Maybe. Lindsay. Yeah. Lindsay Tucker. Lindsay Tucker. Yeah, Lindsay Tucker. Yeah, yeah. Lovely bloke. It's IBF. a woman. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. No, it's, it's a man. It's a man. Yeah, it's a man. Ninja Tucker. You're trying to throw me off now, aren't you? 
Because but, it makes sense for this to be the mandatory. Yeah. Right? Obviously, George, Eddie right. would have seen yeah, that. Yeah, so he wasn't number one, but he was mandatory. So I've got to defend my OBF title against whoever the mandatory is. And George mm. Groves was mandatory. But he mm. wasn't like ranked number two or not number one, two, three or four even. I think he was ranked number six just because of the amount of fights he does, his time in the ring. He's, built, he's not built up enough points. Uh, eligible challenger, as we find out, but... Um, in my eyes, it was like, what's going on here? Why is George mandatory now? Like, I don't really want to fight him. And I knew he punched hard as well. I knew he was quite sparred him. I know them little gloves hurt a lot more than the, the um, spine gloves hurt. So I just thought, it's not going to be really an easy fight with this kid. And it's not a big fight. So I'm not going to get paid. It's like low reward, massive risk. Let's move over to America and get someone who's shot the load. Someone who's over there like Chavez. Get into Vegas, make a load of money. You know, like in your head, you're setting all this steam, but it's this scene for a grand finale finish. Um, but we got that Wembley, didn't we? Mm. After the yeah. first did fight. You, so on the first fight, on the first fight with George, did you feel that that could be your last fight then? If you've uh, gone in and just won comfortably without the controversy and without the stoppage, yeah, probably. Do you think probably. you would have yeah. out after so that? Good, yeah. good question, because the thought process behind it was. I've about had enough now. I didn't train properly for that fight with George, the first fight. I still trained. I was still fit and strong and more than capable. Um, but I wasn't in my head mentally ready and I didn't feel physically as prepared as I should be um, based on previous camps, which I've got all diarised because I'm a bit of a Adrian Mole. Um, I like to write my training down so I know where I am. Um, just being meticulous things. around the, you know, it gives me confidence. It gives me confidence when I look and I know I've had a 12 week camp and I've done all these runs, I've smashed my times, I've done all these push ups and sparring and press ups and pull ups and everything I do. And it's all listed and written down. I'm looking at it thinking, yes, I'm super so, human. So do you, think, do you think you might have been just tired? Like tired as a pro, tired of the big fight after big fight, tired of the pressure? 100%, and then, mentally and, more than physically. And maybe, because you're saying, you're saying that you knew I'd, I'd be a tough fight, but you didn't. Switch but, on. We didn't switch on for it mentally. Is it because it was easier for you to just pretend that this is not the case, or because you're maybe mentally tired, or just like, or yeah, yeah. You, you have been listening to um, Jordan Peterson, aren't you? A clinical psychologist now, look, he's on it. <laughs> so, the, so you delving deep into the the brain of the mind. There's, there was two things, maybe maybe a bit of both of them. I was thinking to myself, um, this could be towards. I'm, I'm tired mentally. Physically, I'm not quite there, but this is going to be a hard fight. But it's not got, like I said earlier, it's not got the massive rewards. So I didn't give you the respect because in my head, I'm going to knock you out with one punch. Which was, like, was, that, was I was convincing any, was, myself, as soon as I land on yeah. your chin with these little tennis gloves, you're going to go over so and you're how, not going to get how, up. How, how, and that was stupid. How obviously. often did you toy with that thought? Because you never, it doesn't matter who you are, You never. I'm sure you've never done that before in your career where you're like... Don't don't worry about anything else because I'm going to be able to chin him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, don't want, I would never want to go into a fight and not. Listen, it was ridiculous. Sure I've had that. I just done that dance show. Just beat Mikel Kessler. I was doing the dance show, and then I get told I'm fighting you. So I trained. Well, I was doing the dance show while I was training. So I trained like for six weeks properly. I was doing the sparring and I was hammering it and I was on it. But in my head, I was just like, I don't really want this fight, and I don't fully know why. So I taught I taught myself around that I'm going to knock you out with one punch. I just thought as soon as I land, and that's that coming from when we sparred, mm. and you had like a flash knockdown, you got straight up, you finished the spar, it wasn't a big deal, but because of my punch power had an effect on you, when I'm gloves and head guard situation, I was just thinking, yeah, as soon as I hit him with them little gloves, I'll probably get him yeah, out of there. I'm not going to walk in round one and knock you over, job done. I knew it was going to be a fight, but I thought, as soon as I start catching you, start hitting you on the chin, I'll be able to get you out of there and it'll be yeah. fine. So yeah. I didn't quite dig in as much, and I wasn't training for that first fight thinking this is my last one, like I did with the rematch at yeah. Wembley. Um, I was training thinking, um, I'm getting paid. I'm, I'm not fully enjoying it, but I'll do it because that's what I do. I've done the dance show. I've got yeah. my kids. Everything, my life changed. Like, you've, done, you've done, you've been doing it for that long. You've been a pro for that long. You've had that many yeah, hard fights. Like, and I've been a pro fight. It's what it is. You just get on with it, don't you? Yeah, you do get on with it. And it's a bit stupid. You take your foot off the gas. And every time you take your foot off the gas in pro boxing or you cheat or you cut any kind of corners, whether it's in your diet or in your training, you always get found out and it's always hard. And I'm not saying that the first fight I got, it was hard because... I didn't train because I was still fit. I'm a seasoned professional. So when I stepped through the ropes with George in the first fight in Manchester, 
I was ready to take anyone on, and I felt fit and strong. My confidence wasn't quite there walking to the ring. I remember thinking to myself, like the demons were in there going, you've not done all the sparring you should have done. You've not done all the running. You've been poncing around doing this dance show. So when uh, are they floating around? Are they in the changing room? On the ring room? walk. Ring walk, yeah. Ring walk, yeah. I'm in the changing room just thinking, I hope something goes out, the power goes off. Or, <laughs> so, really, yeah. <laughs> the fire. That's interesting. Like, That's I'm interesting. I'm just in the changing room thinking, I'm, I'm still not in there. And never happened to you before? You're never... Would you say as an amateur, I'm making excuses. Not, I'm really nervous as an amateur. Yeah. Until but, I, but as a pro, you always felt always you thought, can be really nervous, but you're no, still I'm like, it's fight time. I'm getting in there, I'm doing a job. This could be an odd fight, but I'm I'm tough. I'm fit. I'm strong. I'm resilient. I, I know you've said to me before about, and I've heard it from many other fighters about Rob McCracken and and the influence that he has and the, where his star quality comes from is what would it be like? It's not necess- it's not it's not so much the training. It's like it's, it's the relationship, with, the relationship, and the people. Yeah, as a people person, for me, that's how it worked for me. It was all quite psychological, with Rob. And he can almost get the best out of you with his words. Yeah, hundred percent physically. Yeah, hundred percent. I had a lot of respect for Rob. So when he told me to do something, I did it, and I, I I respect him as a professional. You know, he's a British champion. He fought Howard Eastman. He fought um, he fought Keith Holmes for a world title, and um, he lost that one. He used to kill himself to get. He's seen the size of him. He used yeah, to get down yeah. to middleweight, eleven stone six, and yeah. he's just too big. But there was no opportunity at super middleweight. I don't think Joe Calzaga would fight him. We've got something in common there. <laughs> um, me, me and Rob, I don't think Calzaga wanted to give him a shot. And there's Ben and Newbank wanted to around that. And Rob McCracken was sitting at middleweight, but no one really... I'm not even sure when super middleweight came in. Mm. Was it around... Well, it was a middleweight, wasn't it, Rob? Yeah. Sorry, it was a middleweight. And um, they were sitting around at middleweight rankings. I used to always look at the boxing news and think, Rob McCracken, who's he? What does he look like? I didn't really know him. You know Nigel Ben and Chris Eubank and Steve Collins and the big names. And Joe Calzaghe was sort of on the scene. But I was like Rob McCracken. Then I met him in Ireland. Um, and the amateur world championships, and was chatting away, and I was like, "He's definitely pissed." Like, I was thinking he's drunk. <laughs> so was he, he just out there to watch, watch, or and he, he don't drink, by the way. I just, you know? he's just, and he's not punchy either. He's just quite laid back, Very chilled, yeah. quite slow. He talked to him, and he doesn't get excited. He's like got no emotion. And I was yeah. thinking, is he drunk? And it's like, who spoke... posted a picture from the weekend? And they just won their fight, and Rob's just like, <laughs> he's in the ring <laughs> with them having their last picture. It's like, yeah, and Rob's like. <laughs> yeah, like, to show my emotion. <laughs> but I knew when he was worried or when he was like making me trying to get some out of me, like listen, get your goal on Did you feel anything from him on that first fight then? Any Yeah, he was any he was concerns that Yeah, he, he was concerned had? in the first fight and he was holding it together for me in the ring and yeah. like telling me all the right things I needed to know to keep me motivated, get your guard up, get behind your jab, don't lunge in as all bits, but it was the way it was coming out and there was panic in his voice. <laughs> there, <laughs> there was emotion in there, but I'd just been flattened in round one. And then from round two to round six, until I beat you up, it was um, <laughs> it was a bit of a pasting, wasn't it, for me? Yeah, it I got in with everything, including the kitchen yeah, yeah. sink. Like, you just couldn't miss, could you? No, I couldn't. No, like, no, no. literally couldn't miss. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to get stuck on the, uh, on the fight, and I don't want to keep going back. But something I've always meant to ask you is, David Hay said to me that he came into your change room before the fight, um, and you said to him, this is my Audley Harrison fight. And as if to say, like, it's, it's, a, it's a hype job. People think it's a real fight, but it's not. That's <coughs> obviously, Hay Audley Harrison was. And did you say that I to did him? It. And would I, you? And did you think that? No, and... I did say it to him. I didn't think it. I was waiting to see his response. <laughs> right, right, and he, right. His right. response was: he looked at me funny, and then he swallowed. And I thought, this ain't my old Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. He knows George Groves can fight, unlike old Harrison, um, who, don't, who didn't bloody throw a punch against David yeah. Hay. And that's what I mean. Like for that, for, for me to say it's an old Harrison fight, that would have meant that it was an easy fight. It's going to be a walkover, and I'm yeah. going to get paid well for so it. So this is you finding. Finding some comfort, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't get it. He didn't yeah. agree with me. He didn't disagree with me, but his face was a bit like, come on. He's, he's quite, you know what David A's like? He's friends of everyone. He was all right with you, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, no. He's I, not coming I, in I to me and saying, go and beat George awesome. Groves, yeah. I don't like him. He's always like, with everybody, he's always like, friends yeah. with everybody. He's one of them, everyone love everyone, which is great. Yeah. Um, but I know he was your mate and you trained with him with Adam Booth. Yeah. But I knew him from the amateurs yeah, on, yeah. on so the English squad at Crystal Palace. So you yeah. both won, won medals at that in Belfast. Yeah, right? I got yeah. a bronze and he silvered yeah. in the very next Same fight. Same afternoon. Yeah. yeah, and like me and Amir Khan have had a bit of beef over the years and he's always all right with Amir and he'll say, oh, why don't you and Amir talk and try and get... I'm like, I haven't got a problem with him really. I'm never going to see him. If I do see him, I'll say hello to him. Tell him what I think of him. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> he's one of them in here. He's sound. He's a, good, he's a nice bloke. He's, Let's, got, um, he's got good energy. Yeah, no, yeah. Sorry, don't want to cut the praise for Hay off that. <laughs> let's um, let's skip part, skip through the first fight because we, me and Cole talk about it yeah. every other weekend, right? But so we get just we'll, for the listeners though, what happened in the first fight? Just so in the, fir- the first fight was I performed better than people give me credit for. I dropped Cole pretty heavy in the first round. He gets up, and um, 
gets through gets through the the, the round and then yeah he's, he has a torrid time for the next six rounds we can both agree on that yeah. and then the argument goes slightly differently between six and nine so you know you're not say about to leave this on, on George's opinion of the first yeah, that's fight the end of just yeah, carry yeah, on like, right. <laughs> so anyway it, it gets stopped by Howard Foster yeah famously um, infamously infamously pretty much the vast majority of people will agree it was stopped too early to give Carl because he's come all the way down to come on a podcast um, <laughs> some people depends on if they've listened to Carl's uh, recollection of the fight will say that Carl was going to get me anyway and they were, Carl was robbed of a conclusive ending if they listen to me and my violin, Cole gets his music out and he plays sad, sad music. I'll say, no, nah, it was just in the Chris Moyle's sad song. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> I've got it ready for tonight. Uh, but pretty much what we can't dispute is that... Um, it was controversial. It's controver- controversial in the... Even even the atmosphere in the arena that night, Who were, everyone was on Cole's side. I was like the villain going in. I'm getting booed, spat on, throwed coins at... And then Cole, at the end of the fight... I had the same um, treatment on the way out. He yeah. got the same treatment because, to be to be fair to Carl, it's not his decision to stop the fight. He hates me. He can't let that go now mm. at this point. So, you know, he he still he's still protruding that hate, and people um, yeah people give him give him grief for it. But now we're we're on course now for the last yeah, fight. There's this so, unbelievable clamour from the British public, not just boxing public, either British public. Want to see the rematch? Yeah, got to see the rematch. Yeah, see, without this... me, without me going on to it and giving my version of events on the fight, <laughs> the fight could have definitely gone on. The cut, the fight could have continued when Howard Foster stopped it, um, but it was in his rights to stop it, as far as I and my team were concerned. But the fight could have gone on, and I've seen loads of fights where fights could have carried on going, um, and they've been stopped correctly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but whoever's, seen, whoever's seen the fight will probably say. Like George said, probably 80 or 90% of them will say the fight will stop too early. But I'm not going to sit here and say Howard Foster did a bad job mm. because he's got a job to do and his job is to protect the fight. Exactly. And he did a great job. And it right done, me, it it done, and it done me a right favour. <laughs> we try, we try right right favor. Favor. But what, what, what's fascinating for me is you now there. Um, what happens next? Like, you, 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 you've got the win, but... You've said that you know it didn't feel like a win in some ways. You know, people were on your. Well, the way back. I was received yeah. by the press, the boxing news write-ups, and and the tabloid media, like back pages, we don't usually get that much coverage in boxing. We used to get like four or five pages mm. inside before the, after the football. You used to get in the paper. Don't it was on the back. Yeah, I was in the paper quite a lot. It was yeah. quite big news when when you in the world title fight. But our fight was mega. It was massive. Got loads of real good clippings from that. I've got them all saved um, at home. And um, yeah, it was. Uh, it felt like I lost. Even though I won, I still got the belt. I got booed out of the ring, spat on, coins thrown at me. I got your treatment on the way out of the ring. And, um, and bear in mind, I just had my head punched in. I'd just been knocked down in round one, beat up for six rounds by someone who can punch really hard. Who's bigger than me, you know, it's out of order. It's a weight governed sport. He's big, bigger than me, he should be a light heavyweight. Um, Did you want a rematch? No, nah, not really, not straight away. Not like for 24, 48 hours. I just thought, I've got that out of the way now, it's done and dusted. All right. Okay, so you're still right, thinking about yeah. that Chavez fight now. You're thinking, right? That no, was, one long before. I wanted something. I wanted something tasty, something easy, yeah, yeah, yeah. something big. I want a trip. Can that come something. now? Can that <laughs> yeah. come? Like, I've got rid of him now. I've done what I need to do. I got the win by hook or by crook. I got the win, and um, still got my belt. Now what we're doing? And it's like it soon became a reality that I'm going to have to fight you again. Yeah. When one did that long. pressure? When did within that pressure within 48 in? hours, a couple of days after reading the boxing news, the write ups, looking at the papers and that, because it was the one as much online digital content then, like there is now. Um, did, did that feel like a decision? Nearly 10 years ago. Yeah. But I was like, no, I've got fighting now. It's going to be Wembley. Like we talked about Wembley pretty early. I was, I flew over to Dubai with my family because we don't get many time to have a holiday through the summer. So we went there like January or February. I always used to fight like that. That's November, 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 wasn't it? December, yeah. November it was 23rd. November, yeah. yeah. November 23rd. Um, nearly ten years ago, amazing. So, nearly ten years ago this month. Yeah. Um, it was just a decade, isn't it? This month, it's, like, it's mad how quick that's gone. But yeah, yeah the fight yeah. happened. I'm sure it is. Two, it was on about the 2013, other day. 2013, wasn't it? Nine years this month. Nine years this month. Yeah, yeah ten years, decade. Well, it was election. on about ten years. On this, the, the lying to the fans when we do our evening guest speech. Is it <laughs> ten years to the day this month? Yeah, is it nine years? We did that. It sounds better, doesn't it? A decade. We yes. do it again. Yeah. Almost. We'll pretend it's a decade. So then the the fight, the rematch happens in the May. 
So you're obviously going out, going to the IBF, fly over there to lobby them to get reinstated as a mandatory, which in reality wouldn't happen. If you lose a fight in a by stoppage, they're not going to reinstate oh, as a George mandatory. Oh, George dug his heels in. He was adamant he'll stop too early. Yeah. And he, it was his opportunity to become world champion and he wasn't going to let it go. And I, I got a lot of admiration for him for that mm. because he flew out there and did that pretty much on his own, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That so was early, early in... The next year, then 2013. I think it was beginning of January. I think it took a took a month to settle to f- figure out which route to go. I didn't realise you were doing that, you know. And we'd already kind of decided you know? we were going to be fighting. Like Eddie said, "Don't <laughs> fight George next." I'm like, "Yeah, no yeah, problem." I, and then you well, was doing all that. Obviously, I wasn't told that. Um, and I think there know, was a business thing that said if you go and get yourself made mandate, manda- if you go and get yourself a mandatory position as a non ranked or not not an immediate rank number one or two challenger you're only entitled to 85% of the purse bid mm. so Eddie was like let him go out and get mandated then you'll get more money from the fight you'll get the 85 I'll get as, the 85 as, as, as champion, champion. As champion yeah. yeah and you get, George 15. get 15 I was like yeah let him go and do all that mm. then yeah. I just left him to it like I was just but you'd like at my point uh, my perspective is I'm like yeah, sure. I can. I can assume that Cole wants this rematch. Yeah, you weren't guaranteed the fight getting made. It. No, so you yeah. had to, you had no choice but to go and try and get the fight mandated. And you, 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 know I mean? you know, because there was a chance I wasn't going to fight him if the Chavez fight came up or anything else came up in America. Yeah. And I was thinking, there's Golfkin was around yeah. then. You know, there's a few fighters where there's a few more riskier fights, but it's risk reward over in America fighting a big name. But as soon as George got himself made mandatory and did the job that he did by flying out there and getting his violin out to the commission and. Got the IBF sat around the around the video watching it, and there was, all like, Tucker. there was all like, "This ain't really a bad stoppage, but you know what? We'll give it him. He's flew all the way out here. It's a big, so it's they, a big fight." They gave him the rematch, and um, yeah, I got the phone call. George is now mandatory. I'm like, "All oh, right, okay, fuck's sake." Here we go again. I'll take it seriously. Did you feel like there was any pressure at that point to like go right? I'm ready to go because if you'd sort of started a little bit, because I felt like for me, everything was a battle in the media now as well. So I'm forever trying to be portrayed a certain way like I'm up for the fight and I'm unjust unjustly not champion so I've got to try and put shame on you whichever way I can and whether that be on oh, Cole's ducking me even so I felt like yeah as soon as as soon as I've got as soon as, as soon as I heard that news it's like right I want to release that news I don't want Eddie doing it because Eddie's trying to steal everyone's fucking thunder I want like a bit of news good news on my part and then I want to see what Cole's reaction is he's going to have a knee jerk reaction to yeah, yeah I'm going to fight him anyway and then I'm thinking, well, if I, if I, if I, is that a win for me because I've got a knee-jerk reaction? Or if he takes two weeks to, to come out and say, yeah, you're all right, I'll fight you, then it's like, well, is he, is he dragging his heel because he don't want the fight? I'm going to have to try and play on that. So, but you'd already decided that, you know... This yeah, is, I was this in Dubai next. pretty much a week after I thinged, um, after we boxed, and Eddie Irwin was on the phone to me. I can remember having 25 missed calls on the phone, and then he started ringing my room. And I got a message in my room because he was. He, he thought actually I spoke to Eddie and um, recently a bit of an exclusive here for the George Groves Boxing Club podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie thought I'd signed with Frank Warren. He thought I was. So you're a free agent after the. Yeah, I've never, I've never had a contract. Never, uh, I've always worked on handshake since since my first promoter. I won't mention his name. I just don't do contracts. I've not got a contract with Ron McCracken. So you was fight. My by word fight is with... my bond, and I have a handshake. I look you in the eye, and then that's it. I stick with it. Mm. And I pay so you every... fight by fight with Matram as well. Yeah. So, a yeah, lot of them are, oh, especially at the time, like Kel Brook was, I believe, and Tony Bellew, a lot yeah. of them were. I didn't see a point in a contract. I was like, do a good job, I get paid well, you'll get your cut, and it's an handshake. If you try and rip me off, I'll know you've ripped me off, and then we'll, 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 we'll work again. Mm. You know what I mean? And I'll sort it out. The old school so he was way. worried that you'd you, you gone to Morel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he thought you'd gone to Frank, obviously. The, the For some reason, rival. he thought he'd gone to Frank, I'd gone to Frank Warren. And I was like, no, I was chilling in Dubai. <laughs> Got a headache still from the first fight with George. I was like, just leave me alone. And he was trying to make this fight, realised how big it was of all the press and I'd seen the bit of press and thought yeah they've got to fight him I'm going to have to I can't now retire on the back of that fight that everyone's saying oh you probably lost or you would have lost stoppage was outrageous that was the that was the general consensus of the media especially so what, what did Rob say about it Rob was like look fight him because Rob's compassionate for his fighters but he's also quite an, a businessman it seems. Yeah. even though he's so laid back he he knew it was going to be a massive fight so he's obviously thinking of the coin as well <laughs> you can't you can't not yeah, you know yeah, what I mean yeah. got, but got... if you've if you've won on the night and you're not at your best then he knows if we can get Carl to his best well he did he say to me you got to, you got to do it properly this time that's what he said he said fight him he said no problem he said you know what you've got in front of you now I don't need to tell you how good he is he found out on <laughs> Manchester yeah. he said but now you're going to do it properly. So you've got to stay in Sheffield. So I stayed in Sheffield Monday to Friday um, and went home at the weekends. We're in the first fight. I was driving home every night on the motorway. How hard was that, staying away from home? 
not too bad. I quite enjoyed it. Yeah. So you felt like it was easy to get in the zone for Yeah, for because I'm up in the... Because mo- when you're at home, you get uh, you get up and you like look out the window and it's raining and you think, oh, you know, you've got them silk pyjamas on because I've obviously had a great career. And you can't be arsed. Like, I got to the point where I couldn't be bothered. And my best mate, Adam, used to come and knock on my door and say, come on then, let's go running. And I used to think, why are you running? He's like a project manager of an electrical firm. And he's out running with me and he's better than me at running. Yeah. <laughs> and he's not even a pro boxer. So I was thinking, if I can't even stay with him, I shouldn't be in the game. So I used to make sure I stayed with him and beat him at the end of the run. So he was really good motivation for me. But he'd only probably come twice a week. I had to do three or four, four or five runs a week. Um, so it's not properly what, proper when I'm at home. And then I miss the strength and conditioning session. And then I have my lunch, sit at home, have my lunch, watch loose women and think, oh, shall I go to the gym this afternoon? Or shall I just do a bit of shadow boxing? And I phone Rob up and say, my back's a bit sore. So when you go today. to the gym, do you have to drive from Nottingham Sheffield? Yeah. So it's a, yeah, it's a pain in the arse driving up the motorway, then driving back. back. It's just like, what's the point? I'm just to be at home. You know what I mean? So I was getting ready and settling down to being like, I don't really want to be boxing, do I? I'm not enjoying it anymore. The desire's not quite there. But the rematch with you, George, was full on. Stayed in Sheffield, enjoyed it, got in the zone. I was doing ice baths. I was talking to the sports psychologist. This was the for those who don't yeah. know the Sheffield. So yeah, the, English the, Institute of Sport yeah. in Sheffield. And I was running with all that youth and enthusiasm every morning. Did, did that help? Running track. Oh, massive. Having all those amateurs Yeah, because I got up and I was like an old car horse. And then <laughs> I get going and then I'm on the track with them running, like trying to stay with them. So Anthony wh- Fowler and Go-Go think, and all them mm, fighters. Sorry, when do you think last fight mentality kicked in then? Was you, did you get to Sheffield and you know then what? did you think this is it or was, was it in it, Dubai? Was you in Dubai? Um, no, it would have been during the camp. It wasn't in Dubai like this is my last fight. I'm going to go for it. This is like this is a, I've got to beat George in this fight. I'm taking this fight. I've got to win. I've got to train properly and go for it and give it my best. And if I get beat, I've got to be doing my best. I don't mind losing if I give it my best. Do you know what I mean? But I don't want to lose like I did in the amateurs once and in an Olympic qualifier, and I didn't leave it all in the ring. And I didn't get to see the Olympics because I lost by one point um, on an Olympic qualifier. And I just thought, I didn't even let my shots go. I'm not even knackered. I was back behind my jab and I, I didn't take the chances and I didn't want to work hard. So I didn't want to get tired. I just, like, you know when you're learning? Just naive, really. And I got out of the ring and lost 3-2 to a Polish geezer called Paweł Kikitek in Poland. And I was hammering him. I thought, I could have hammered him more. I could have done more work. could have put it on him and really tried to get him out of there. But I didn't. I sort of sat back behind the jab. So... From that lesson, as an amateur, I never wanted to do that as a professional. So I used to always try and leave it all in the ring. Mm. So when I knew I was fighting you again, I thought to myself, I've just got to concentrate on the fight and get the job done. But halfway through the camp, to answer your question, with the injuries and having to ice pack my, my lower back and my elbows, I had all duct tape around me, like electric, you know that mm. elastic tape around me, both my arms, because my elbows are so sore. Were you um, doing that yourself? Yeah, like putting it on and around. Like a uh, physio. Like physio like my male elbows are killing me. Like if I bend them too much, I'll get punched in the arm when it's bent. It, over, it, it overflexes it and kills the arm. And if I miss with a shot and it jolts the arm, it overextends the arm. And the pain in the elbows, I've had cortisone injections in both elbows. And I've had an operation on one, I've had it and that, but it's just sore. So you're thinking And I'm like, thinking, my elbows are killing when I'm sparring. I'm not enjoying it. Every time I get up in the morning for my morning run, I'm just fucked. Like, I don't want to get out of bed, but I do, because I'm in Sheffield. And then I'd start a 10 minute jog, get into it, wake up, and then, oh, I'm here, I'm in the room, let's do, let's have a good session. Um, and halfway through the camp, I was thinking, I, I don't think I've got enough one of these in there. I don't think I'm going to be able to. Even only at 36, I say only 36, you was 30 when you retired, weren't you, George? Yeah. Hopkins was 40. And I'm 45 years old, sat here now, and I feel fit and strong, and I'm in the gym every day. Um, so it's mad, but. To be at that level as a professional athlete and to fight the way I fought, you had to be at your best. I'm not the most skillful fighter. I won two ABA titles and a medal in the world, but I'm still not that skillful. I've got a good jab, I've got a good right uppercut, and I can have a fight up close. But I'm not really fast. I ain't got fast hands. you know. But what I have got is I've got a refusal to quit. I've got a granite chin, and I'm a stubborn fucker, and I'll just keep fighting to the death. You're going to have to iron me out on the canvas and keep me there otherwise I'm going to get up and keep coming for you and I do not quit just have a look at my Jermaine Taylor fight first world title defence I had to stop him in the last round and I just pushed forward from round 10 round 10 round 11 round 12 I was getting him getting him getting him I didn't stop throwing punches until it wasn't mad and smothering my work it was it was a good old someone's put a good rocky anthem on that last on yeah, the it's on amazing the fight. Fight. It's yeah, never seen it. even now it makes my hair stand on end when I watch it yeah. and that was on Sunday afternoon with adverts between each round on ITV yeah, yeah. Could have been done. But, so, yeah, so with that little yeah. that mind sh- mindset shift, then do you feel like it was your your attributes as a fighter, your main 
things that you're good at, then as soon as you start thinking, I don't know if I could do this again, or this, I'm, I'm near the end here. Now, when I decided yeah. that this is probably going to be my last fight, that was actually a bonus for me. Because all the, all the heartache and pain I was in running, and I say heartache, it's not heartache, but the trauma you put yourself in, and having to get your mind geared up for it. Because when you've got desire and you enjoy it, like I used to most of my career, you get up and you happily go on a run. And you go in the gym to spar, and you're thinking, this is going to be good sparring. I've got Tony Bellew trying to take my head off. I better keep out of the way of that right hand, but I'm going to hit him with an uppercut today and see how he stands up to the hook. I'm going to work the body, see if that fat belly can take these big shots. You know what I mean? But he was bigger than me and stronger than me, and he gave me some tough sparring, Bellew did. But I was always challenging myself and always looking forward to it, where in the final fight with George, the Wembley one, it was like I'm, I'm dragging myself through the sessions. I've got Chris Eubank Jr. and his old man filming every spar. And Eubank Jr. is a strange character. Everyone knows who he is. And um, Chris Eubank Jr. means business. He's tough. He's confident. He comes in. He wants to leave it all in the ring, which is great sparring. But I just want to join the spars. I was like getting through the spars. Proper good spars. Tiring. Hard work. You know, putting the shots together and working hard, breathing hard, doing the runs solid. But just not really quite wanting to do, do it where I'm enjoying it. Yeah, that reminds me of when I was boxing near the end. And it is, excuse me, it becomes a bit more of a slog and it's tough and you're not enjoying it. So to find pleasure in it, you give yourself an end date. Like, you're like, well, I'm I'm putting myself through it here and, and enjoy it because this, this, this is, you know, for me, I set like a three fights, but for you, it was one fight. You do that so that it, you you can almost enjoy it. You know, does that? Would I've that only had that though, that feeling in that fight with us in the rematch, yeah. and, and I was telling myself then when I started to not enjoy it. And the reason I didn't enjoy it is because I was injured. Like I was, I was in pain. I was waking up like Wednesday morning, trying to get out of bed, and my back's killing me. My neck's really sore from the spa. My elbows are fucking inflamed, and I've got bandages on both elbows. Thinking, am I going to be able to spar today? Probably not. I might not be able to do the pads. And it was that that made me not enjoy it. I wanted to do the runs I used to be able to do, and I wanted to do the rounds of sparring, but I physically couldn't because of injuries, because of hard? aches and pains. Is it hard to feel like your, your body's... I used to load myself up with a up tablet with called Declophenic Sodium. That's um, an anti-inflammatory. Anti-inflammatory, yeah. aggressive one. You can have... Um, nop- is it naproxen? No? Yeah, naproxen, yeah. I mean, they give me, like... They make me go mad in my head. I had some of them. And I started getting depressed. It's weird. Like, I started having suicidal yeah. thoughts. It's weird. Serious like, chemicals to get yourself through this. Yeah, stuff. and I'm naproxen. So I went, I went back on the... Uh, was that when you were fighting? Full anti-inflammatories on them. Um, Declophenics, yeah. They weren't a bad sub- banned no. substance. So you could take them. It's like an ibuprofen, anti-inflammatory. But they literally worked. But um, I've not got ulcers in my stomachs and bloody burnt holes in my intestines and that. I don't even know because I used to live on them, 100 milligram ones. I used to take three or four of them every bloody day to get me through the day. And there's brilliant painkillers. And um, yeah, just stopped enjoying it. But I, I told myself, it's all right, this is the last fight you're going to have. When you've, when you've done this fight, I see you're done, you're not doing this again. So get up in the morning and it'd be cold and wet and you'd be aching and you think, I ain't got to do this again after this fight. As soon as this fight's done, I said, let's get out there and let's enjoy it. And I was nice. relaxed. And I was confident and I was pushing pushing through the gym sessions. And even down to the ring walk, I was thinking, this is my last ring walk. Because I'm nervous on the ring walk. You get nervous. 80,000 people at Wembley Stadium. Don't mention it much. But um, you don't take a look around and get nervous. You just think to yourself, I've got a job to do. And when it's your last time you're doing it, you have a little look and take it in. But it's business, isn't it? You, See, yeah. You had, you had Chris Martin, a uh, sports psychologist as well. Chris Marshall. Chris Marshall, sorry. Yeah, he was not in Coldplay. He was in Coldplay. He was like with the cricket, yeah. Yeah. Chris Marshall, and he was he was just up there with the England squad, and it was like a mate who used to chat to him, have a crack like you do with all the people up there. And Rob McCracken said to me one day, oh, "I want you to talk to Chris Marshall." Mm. I went, "Well, what about?" He goes, "No, just talk to him, tell him about George and that." He said he's a really good like psychologist. I went, "I'm not asked about talking to someone about my fucking feelings in my head and that." And when you got hold of it, you took the piss out of me, didn't you? Well, that's what he I was, was going to say. Did you? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know how I think and felt about it. I can't really remember whether I would have genuinely thought it was a sign of weakness. But I thought, I'm going to try and make you feel like this is a sign of weakness. Um, mm. I don't think it worked, but that was... How did you think of it? Was you conscious that oh, I might try and exploit this some way? Because I was um, trying to take... I am trying to exploit everything. Maybe a little bit, but you know what? The conversations I had, we didn't sit in a room with like electrons way on my head with your hand on something, and then you're talking deep. I was like on the watt bike, and I'm just burning a bit of calories off, just easy pace, just sweating like a lunatic, like doing them bikes, just chatting. And he's like, "What? What annoys you when George Grove says something?" I'm like, "It's the context of what he says, right?" So when he says something and doesn't give you any respect, 
what do you do? You react emotionally. You let it bother you instead of being logical with it. And he, he just taught me how the brain works, logic and emotion. And the amygdala, which is like the honing beacon for danger, that picks up the danger. And George Groves was the danger. And putting it in simple terms now, by the way. And if he says something, what I was doing is I was resp responding emotionally, like angry, pissed off, angry, hated him, wanted to knock his head off. Where now he's like, he said, you don't need to respond like that. Just resp if you just respond logically and smile and realise why he's doing it, he's trying to get inside your head, he's trying to cause all this reaction. There's no danger. Just putting to learn, there ain't any danger. It's like, it's not. A p and I was like, oh yeah. And you think he said that and explained how the brain worked and drew it on a bit of paper in the office for, for like the first. And then after that, we were just chatting to him on the what by. He said, how do you feel today? How do you feel after that spa? Like, you feel a bit nervous going to the spa. How did you think it went with Chris Eubank and when I used to spar with your, um, Tony Bellion? I was like, yeah, it was all right, it was good. I was a bit nervous going in, but I just settled down behind the job. Not really deep conversations, just just a friendly chat. But sometimes that's all you need, just to make your brain identify what's going off. When you don't understand how you're feeling and what your thoughts are. I spoke to a young kid yesterday, a 12-year-old, um, who was amateur boxing. He says, I'm always nervous, I'm always nervous. How do you get over it? I spoke to a lad as well at the, the show we did in, in Scotland last week. Mm. And I went, just enjoy yourself as much as you can. If you are really, really nervous, just just pretend you're not nervous. Just pretend you're not. And I know you are nervous, but just pretend to everybody that you're not. Hold your chin in there, smile when people look at you, make eye contact, smile. And as much as you're scared inside, as much as nervous as you are, just walk around like you in the game. There's a saying, isn't there? Fake it till you make it. So you're basically pretending not to be nervous. And then you'll get in there, you'll fight, you'll win, you'll do the business, you'll think, what was I worried for? Well, I didn't show anyone I was worried, so actually I'll do that again next time. And just little stages like that. And that's the advice I give him. So with Chris Marshall, it was just a friendly chat. Bit of banter, bit of piss tape, but understanding how the brain works, and then just right. Don't give Groves, don't give George too much thought. Just did you did you hate let him, him do what he did? The first fight, first yeah, fight. I was fuming. It's like yeah. ridiculous. Like why did I hate him so much? He did piss me off. That <laughs> yeah, you I was were like, good though. You did it. And he's such a good fucker. troll. Oh, Still man. is. Yeah, proper troll. <laughs> 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 such a good troll. <laughs> Done me up like a kipper. Yeah. And in the rematch, I was like, I'm not fucking bothered. I'm training. And that was I'm, down to Chris Marshall. A lot of that. Yeah, a lot of it was. Mm. A lot of it was. And the fact that I won the first fight. As controversial as it was, and in my head I was ill prepared. I look at my diary and go, "Fucking hell, I did a lazy bastard. Did like sixty rounds of sparring that first fight. Didn't do half my runs. Didn't do enough. I'm still fit and strong, so I don't want to take down, don't want to play down the performance from George. He, he, he gave so, he, he gave me a great fight in that first fight, um, albeit a loss by stoppage. Um, <laughs> it was a great fight. So it, performed, yeah. it performed well, um, but." Like in the rematch, I'm thinking, bloody hell, if I train properly, do my runs and give it everything and, you know, do all my sparring, how can he beat me? Like, I, it's impossible for him to win in my head because he can't knock me out because he's already hit me with his biggest shots. Like, he hit me with one that put me over and then punched me numb for six rounds and I was still stood there. So I'm not too worried about getting knocked out. I'm not stupid. I know I still could probably be knocked over, but I'd, I've never been knocked out. I've never, I've never been knocked down as an amateur. I've only been knocked down twice as a pro. Um, first one against Jermaine Taylor, second one against George. And Tony Bellew gave me a little tickled right hand that I walked into. He set me up for a right hand and <laughs> backed me into his corner, he did. And then as I, as I launched it, he sat back and threw a nice little yeah, time right hand. It's the exclusive club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not many can put all So all I don't get knocked out. So I don't go into a fight thinking I could get knocked out here. Yeah. I go in there <laughs> thinking this could be a really hard fight, um, especially given the first one me and George had. But I was just thinking, I had a great camp. I've got myself through it telling me it's my last fight. Like day after day, but I was in Sheffield. I know it's. I, I couldn't stay in bed in Sheffield. I was up, my alarm goes off, and I know Rob and all the lads are outside waiting for me. So I can't just not turn up. So I get up, and it'd be cold, and I'd be like, "What, what was it? It was May, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, it was a bit cold." And um, so you've been like March, April, April March, yeah. yeah just coming, into, coming into the cold. spring, yeah. it was coming Rainy. into the spring. What were the emotions like then? You talk about last fight, but you know, picking your last fight gear and last weigh in. And last fight week yeah, press comments. I didn't and think too much you about know it. This in your head. And you're not telling us the journalists. Yeah, I didn't think like, too much about didn't. it. I was upset. I lost my bloody robe and I lost my gum shield as well. That gum shield with the. What, well, you lost it since, yeah? Yeah, soaps have misplaced it. <laughs> Said someone next I saw that on eBay. Yeah, he's got it. I know. He's, 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 he's got it. <laughs> so that gum shield's gone. And your robe from the from the thingy fight, not not from that fight, from the um, one of the Super Six. I think it was the Abraham fight. My robe got nicked. I'm sure Celso probably got that in his, yeah. <laughs> in his trophy room. Are you conscious <laughs> not to think about that as okay? This is my last. This is my last the whole time. And no, you try no, and put it to the back now. Out. Thinking back now, no, I wasn't really thinking about it. Just yeah. during the training camps when it got hard, I would be like, "I'm not doing this again. It's the last one." So you found comfort in it. And no one knows, yeah. And I just thought, no, just dig in. Let's get let's get it done. I wasn't really enjoying the training like I used to. I used to enjoy training. Like when I look back now, the training I used to do, I 
fucking proper lunatic. Some of the hills in Nottingham, Bartholomew's, call it Donkey Hill, and um, Carlton Hill and Douglas Hill, like proper steep, big hills. You like run up the side of a cliff. The, the steepest hill in Nottingham, Frieda Avenue. I used to do hill sprints on that. I think that's the reason why Joe Calzaghe was so fit, because, you know, the valleys in, in Wales, just running around there, just, it just you just get fit. And I was so fit and strong at running up hills and my lungs nearly exploding and my heart rate getting up to like 200 beats a minute for sustained periods of time. I was fit and strong. And um, I was fit and strong for that rematch because I'd done all the runs and I was matching runs and I was doing extra stuff with the kids, like the, the sprint stuff, the fast stuff. Because they do short, sharp stuff at the amateur squad, at the, at the England squad, because they're amateur boxers. It's shorter. So I'd do the stuff with them. And then I'd carry on and do my few bits extra to make it a longer run. But now I was supremely confident walking into the rematch, um, but full, fully aware that anything can happen. Um, but yeah, I was just thinking, seek and destroy. Mm. Were you thinking about Wembley? Like, was that a big carrot? The fact that it was, like we say, the first one of this on the build up, yeah. Fight I was like, wow, is this going to be 80,000? Yeah. yeah, I spoke to Robbie Williams, name drop. Um, Cole Brazil, who's good mates with Roman Kraken, he's like in the family, like. Somehow, he's, I think he's his ex-wife's nephew. Um, he's a drummer, Carl Brazil, top drummer. for He, he drummed for Ed Sheeran, Robbie Williams, um, James Blunt. I've been on quite a lot. I'm into music. I don't know if you know, I'll play the guitar. Yeah, I, I didn't bring it Should've in today. <laughs> didn't bring it in. Get the guitar. I can go home and get it if you want, like yeah. David Brendan. Let's have a song time. Yeah. But he put Robbie Williams on the phone. And uh, I thought, wow, what's, is he coming? Uh, Robbie Williams. I was like, how are you doing, Robbie? All right. He said, yes. And I went, you've performed at Wembley, haven't you? What's it like when you... And he just told me about when he come out on stage and the place was packed. And he says, it, it doesn't make any difference whether it's a massive... He says, just be grateful that it's busy. He says, because I've played in front of places when they're only half empty when he's starting up. And I thought when I used to box at Bethnal Green and there was like two and a half, three thousand people there. And sometimes it won't even fall on the top balcony. You don't want to be performing your your chosen sport or your talent and nobody's cares so nobody's coming to see you mm. so I was just grateful that it was more people mm. I sort of got over the crowds at Nottingham not six, seven, eight thousand then the O2 in London for the Kessler rematch 20,000 and I'd done that one in Herning, Denmark so I've been in some big crowds obviously not done this size mm. and it was it was massive and I was like wow Wembley Stadium um, but it didn't make a big deal of it like I was just matter of fact maybe long in the tooth 36, 37 years old Still got a fight in the middle of been it. Around, it? Been around pro boxing for quite a while. Got Rob McCrack in my corner as a proper man's man. No no fucking around. Straight talk. You know what I mean? Like, hard as nails. Um, he was a um, Birmingham fan, one of the blues. Mm. Part of the Zulus, big, I think. Big Zulu. Fucking aggro, mate, back in them days. <laughs> but the 80,000 went like that as well, didn't it? There was no the tickets were sold in. That was a massive sell. Minutes, wasn't it? Well, listen, George did a great job on the first yeah, first really job, helped. winding me up. Yeah. Obnoxious prick, man, bad. I fucking hated him, like literally. <laughs> That's how it was. But he did a great job. The first fight was brilliant in terms of couldn't have gone better for George other than the fact that he got stopped um, because he knocked me down in round one and batted me for six rounds. And everyone was like, "That's been stopped too early." So the controversy was mad. everyone was baying for my yeah, blood. Without that, you ain't everyone wanted movie. to see the rematch. So it crossed over to a whole new audience. We've got the armchair fan involved. And and there it was, 80,000 that Wembley sold out in what, a matter of hours? It mm. was sold. I mean, does it sell out in two hours? I don't know, but it was sold out. It was it full. It was full. Yeah, it was, it was genuinely full. Like, people wanted to be there. I mean, people were buying tickets because I think they could make money selling them on, and they probably did, and they did sell them on, you know. <laughs> Do you think the record packed. has been broke? Because I was at the... I was at the AJ Klitschko fight and there was empty seats in it. I'm a, I, I didn't, didn't get invited. I don't know who was, counting the, the, I don't know was well. counting the seats, but there was a few empty seats, mate. I think, yeah. we've, I think we smashed it. No, I think yeah. we, yeah. we've still, <laughs> we still got, got we've still record. got the record. <laughs> <laughs> Unofficially. Were you so were you were you aware or were you thinking at all that this could be Carl's last fight? If you if you do a job, yeah, I suppose I, I probably was thinking could send at his age. Retirement. I was thinking, yeah, if I beat Carl, like I doubt he wants to go back to the world do you know what I mean does he want to come back he's, and he would have earned mega money in that last fight so, so was you thinking this is all or nothing for Frotch so I might get the best of him or was you just still arrogantly and nonchalantly thinking you're going to just <laughs> give me a beating <laughs> no I mean I genuinely thought it's going to it's going to be a hard fight you know I didn't you don't I didn't give him an ounce of credit in the build up for the first fight for the reason of I didn't want you know just didn't want to make him feel comfortable I felt like that was he, there was there was definitely an element of him where he, he seeked it, so don't give it to him. Like, we're having a fight. I'm, you know, it's me versus him. He's trying to take everything. He's in my way, you know, ruddy bar. So, second time round, nah. That's why we had a slightly different game plan. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've been with Carl now, and retrospectively, we could both see how 
he thought that the fight went exactly how he wanted to, but the same for me in, in the beginning of the first fight because the game plan for me wasn't just to jump on him and try and, try and hurt him because, you know, you don't always land that, that, that big right hand in the first round. Usually, my style would be a flat first round in that it would be really technical, just find the range, don't get hit with nothing. If I land one, maybe two right hands are great. So technical, technical battle. I used to fight moving around the ring. Gave away a bit too much ground, I think. So didn't really put Carl under the pressure that I did in the first fight. But he's sort of now he's taking centre of the ring with boxing, and as it's going, you know I think it's going okay. You know my mindset during the fight was, this is okay. I'm, I'm winning the rounds. The rematch was always, totally different, wasn't it, to the first one? Mad. Just a totally different it's fight. Totally different. It's, were you were you different? Did you do anything different? Or were you just thinking, I'm going to be better? I, I noticed I in do. the first fight, I was on the outside of the ring and George was backing me you up. I was lot. trying to look for the counter, but I was like on my bike a bit. But that was because I got flattened in round one. You get knocked down. I was going forward in round one. I walked into a shot. And then it was like survival mode, but not surviving by running, holding and grabbing. But in my head, survival mode is staying behind the jab and trying to time shots. And then when, you t when, the, when it comes, and George was coming, he was coming for me. I didn't have to go looking for him in that first one. I was trying to time him, but he was too quick for me. I was a bit concoursed. I was a bit split second behind him. He just beat me to the punch. I was like seeing the opening, thinking, "Here's his chin. Here we go. Here's one in, and bosh, one with it, man." And I remember rolling, thinking, "I'll get the uppercut in, another right under it, man." And I'd be thinking, "Throw a look now," and then another shot at him, and I'd be like, "Fucking hell, I'm missing." I sat by my corner. I was like, after round six, I sat down and said to Robert Kraken, "Fuck me," like because he didn't move about five or six shots where I was just a split second behind him, and my head was just bouncing around like the bloody, you know that softball on the top of the spring that you get your kids from Argos when they're about four. I was like one of them. <laughs> well, I remember feeling pressure in Wembley Stadium, like obviously it's pressure because it's, it's um, and I think the crowd, you can't help but factor in the crowd and the occasion and everything else. You try not to let it get in the way. It's got, you stay emotionally detached from you the You put fight. yourself under a bit of pressure though. You came in on the top of a double-decker yeah. boss, a London well, yeah, boss. You, you, you know, the whole time I've talked big, Talk the biggest is going to be and some so fire. One, there's some deliver. fire sticks juggling. Yes, yeah, it's got to look the bollocks. Couple right? of chicks, you, know, yeah. you, you, I was disappointed with your ring walk. Like you're just about matter of fact about business. You know what a couple I mean? of so, fireworks, weren't they? On mine, two lasers. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you, really. you didn't. You, you hundred percent did not specify what your ring walk was going to happen you're just like oh, you probably fight. didn't know there was they there told was me five. they told me <laughs> you come here then you go around there then you walk to the ring there yeah. I went sand I didn't yeah. like, have anything <laughs> orchestrated no, I, mean, I, I mean when then, did you see when did you hear about the bus when because you're the champion not until the next day when I saw it I didn't really? see the bus on the so, night so you're the champion so champions walk second so you're yeah. in the change unless they told me there was a bus and I was like oh whatever I'm because, not yeah. bus. yeah I, like, I couldn't remember and I saw the bus I thought oh that's pretty cool that's a good entrance they probably asked if you went to and then he walked to the ring after the bus he got off the bus he walked around quite cool had a little smile looked around and then he did like the bushwhackers you remember the bushwhackers, yeah. the wrestlers? Like, yeah. He walked to the ring like, <laughs> walked to the ring like a bushwhacker. Yeah, so that, that was, was my thing. That was my style. <laughs> I wanted and, uh, to get in right, and have a fight. Get there. But it was a long, it's nice because it's a nice long walk, isn't it? Wembley Stadium, you know, you got a bit of time. You did I keep you waiting? I can't remember if I kept you waiting. Yeah, probably did, yeah. Because they said to me like six in... minutes and then they said, right, you're on. And I just thought, yeah, let's go. Let's go and do it. I didn't. So I tried to make a fuss of Carl's first fight where... <clears throat> And I understand what happens. Like everyone wants to be part of the show. Do you know what I mean? So, but he jumped in the ring with a lot of a big entourage. So then I was like, right, where can I find a weakness in this? I was like, are oh, you hiding behind everyone? Wherever he was, I know it doesn't matter. But if he thinks that I think that, and then if I can convince a couple of people, I get his backup. So I was, I was interested to see: is he going to get in the ring with just Rob? Is he going to be? Rob and his brothers is going to be Rob Did loads get in the ring? I can't remember. I can't, yeah, I can't remember. I can remember turning my back to him, and that was premeditated. So yeah, so I agree with Chris was... Marshall. Get in the ring. Don't look at him. Don't give him anything because he's taking everything he can, and you've you've ignored him all the way through. So get in the ring, and for the first time in your career, just turn your back on him and let him announce your name with your back to him. So you must have been stood in the middle of the ring yeah, looking at me. Yeah, so, was that the last time? Is that the first time you've done that? What first time I've ever done it. The last time someone had done that to me was John Pierce in the amateurs, and it made me nervous. I was thinking, oh, he's not even looking at me. Like, he's, he's warming up, facing the other way. And the bell went, and it would have said, to the centre of the ring, turn around, centre of the ring, touch gloves, went back to his corner, tapped his glove, then come out shooting, and I'm like, oh, bollocks. Mm. I had to go, I beat him on points. Majority decision. Good fighter, John Pierce. So how did that feel? Commonwealth obviously... gold medalist, ABA champion. That was my middleweight campaign. But yeah, go on. 
Brilliant. <laughs> no, I've got to give him a bit of credit. He's just yeah, he just beat cancer piece. recently, and he's, he's doing well. Cool. He, was, well he was a top Dave, fighter yeah. as well. Mm. Um, but if he listens to this, which he obviously will, because it's the George Grove Boxing <laughs> yeah. Club podcast. Yeah, he's in. He's, he's in, in the club. Listening to he's this. in the club. <laughs> you, what was he going to say? Yeah, no, because you're not facing me, so I can't see you, but you can't see me either. No, nah, but I'm so interested in looking at yeah, you. Turn, no, but then you turn around and it's like, first time. Yeah, true. Yeah, quite, it's, it's, a bit so, so, so it's a bit of both, isn't I it? I wanted to show you my gum shield, because I've got this gum shield that like does your jaw and aligns your jaw, makes you punch harder. Oh, and so you've got a head of the curve. I've got one of them, but not for another four And apparently years. he wanted one. That's what the guy told me. He said, but if you're going to have one, I'm not going to let him have one. And that would piss him off. And I was like, yeah, get me one. What kind of, and it's got a logo on it. It's had think. something in the middle there. I forgot what it was called. And I made sure that when I went to the centre of the ring, I showed it, I like, smiled at it. He said, oh, I've got the gum shield on. I've <laughs> got the good one. So I'm going to be it in order. <laughs> that was in my head, though. And I'm like, he's seen the gum shield, he's shitting himself. <laughs> That's a win. Yeah, no, I love that. But like I little things that, like that. So I give him my back, I showed him my gum shield, and I was like, just in my head, I was just right, and I was got to land the shot and just take my time. But you asked about what I did differently. I was in the centre of the ring in the rematch, and I wanted the smallest possible ring as well, because I knew I wasn't going to take a step back. So I wanted to put George on corners and ropes. Did you realise it was a small ring or did you have any say in it? Uh, I can't remember. We tried to have a say in it, but I wasn't fast either way. So I asked for a small ring. I prefer a bigger ring. That's for a small ring. So if you're in the centre of the ring and you're putting your opponent on his back foot, you want him to not have really many places to go. You know what I mean? If you're Mike Tyson, you want a small ring. If you're Muhammad Ali, you want a big ring. I was going to sort of take the centre of the ring and try and back George up and make him react. And he did really, didn't you? From round one, he was kind of on your back foot a lot of the time circling the ring if you watch it on like time lapse it's just George going one way then the other way and he landed probably a couple more shots than what I landed on him George was probably winning the fight but it was a bit of a non-fight it was just technical game of chess me taking centre ring trying to back him up trying to get he got a bit closer didn't it around 6-7 landed a couple of body shots you went with a couple of head shots you went with an awkward screw shot that sort of jolted my head back and I thought what was that I think you turned a jab into a bit of an uppercut or something mm. something caught me and jolted my head back and I was like don't matter don't matter back anymore and I was working the body a little bit trying to work the body but in my head I was just I've got to land this big shot and I tried that left up right hand once and just fell short in the round before and it was all sort of one overthought I don't overthink in fights you fight I don't know about you but I'm sure most fighters fight on like reaction it's just every action causes a reaction like Newton's first law or is that the other one but um <laughs> If George comes out firing, I've got to react to what he's firing at. Mm. And if he's not doing much, then I'm not going to do a great deal. So he can't react. So I was just waiting for, backing him up, but waiting. And he didn't give me much to work with because there wasn't much happening. I thought, he's not coming for it. Like round one, sat down, round three, round five, sitting down thinking, it's probably closest fight. There's not much happening. I've got to start getting a bit closer. And by round six, seven, you naturally start to slow down and settle your feet down a little bit and start to plant your feet because it's tiring. Just being on your feet for 18 minutes, moving around stopping the guy in front of you from knocking you out or trying to knock you out even if you're not landing much, many shots and you're not getting hit with many it's still that mental and physical battle of being aware moving your feet and like you get blisters on your feet after about around four or five if you don't grease your feet up properly because it's that intense um, and by around seven your feet start to hold you get a bit flat footed and I was just getting a little bit close to George I was just starting to get closer to him not by a margin I want out boxing, I won't win in the fight or anything like that. I was just getting a bit closer and started to get a couple of body shots. And you sat on the ropes at one stage, didn't you? And dropped your gloves and a couple of body shots. Was that the first fight? When was yeah, it? That was the first fight. That was probably the first right. fight. But there was a part when he was on the ropes and I, I just missed with a right hand and I left. There's that little bit you can remember. It's amazing when you watch the fight a bit. You think, oh, I remember that little bit there. Um, but that shot that I knocked you out with in front of 80,000 at Wembley when I landed on the mandible section of the cranium rendering you unconscious yes. momentarily it came from nowhere it's yeah. not like I thought I'm going to throw a check hook right hand and flatten him here it was just like a little fate then I'll it's try that, like that. Boom, boom, and it just connected it yeah. just landed it couldn't have landed any more perfect like I don't knock people out of one punch it don't happen like that in my, in my I'm not a massive puncher in that sense where I'll hit you with half a shot because you only land half a shot when you're boxing you never very you very rarely land a full heavy hard shot unless you've got your opponent hurt and he's like got nowhere to go and you hit him with a big shot and then you start loading up a bit and slowing your punches down. You don't often land clean. And um, I suppose I was lucky or George was unlucky or because I trained hard and got myself out, I made my own look. Whatever it was, it was like you said in the ring, a punch from the gods because mm. it was an amazing punch that landed flush. It couldn't have hit George any harder. I couldn't have hit him any harder if I'd have said, stand there, don't move. And I'd have ran at him and hit him with a big free shot. Couldn't have landed any harder. And you could see the impact. His head flew back. 
and he knocked him out straight away and he was down. Similar to the first shot I got hit with in the in the first fight, mm. but probably it's not. Like, yeah, but that was probably harder. But you can't really train for that. You don't know that's going to happen. It's just make sure when you get in that ring, you're as fit and as strong as you can be. You've got self-belief and um, usually... So, so, you know, in the, so in the build-up, you're sore, the whole training camp, elbows, back, neck, all yeah. that. By the time you get in the ring, obviously adrenaline's flowing and all this yeah. sort of stuff. Do you feel a million dollars? Yeah, and you have you... two or three days off before the yeah. fight. Same for you in that yeah, fight. Yeah, I used to do a like... short, sharp run on Monday, like a three-mile of fast. That would be my last hard run, and I'd be feeling that on a Tuesday. And then on the Wednesday, I'd do a little sprint session, and I'd be like, I'd do like four 80 metres. No, I wouldn't even do that because I do 8 to 60 and 40 and 20 later on. But I do like four 60 meter sprints. 60 meter sprints just short. So warmed up, real good warm up. So you don't want to train your hamstring or pull anything. And then just do a 60 meter like burst, just energy. And then jog back, fully recovered, nice and relaxed, go again. Mm -hmm. Do four of them. And that's it. That's it. Four short, sharp, explosive sprints where you feel like you're ready to then go on a big run or you could do loads more sprints, but you don't stop. You just you leave it in there. I didn't do I didn't do much Thursday. Tiny little bit of shadow boxing, mm. and then that's just before the weigh-in. Or a little bit of pads with Rob as I got a bit older. A bit of pads, get a bit of a sweat on. Jump on the scales. Twelve stone one, twelve stone two. I'm weighing twelve stone tomorrow morning for the weigh-in. I'm ready, and then um, yeah, turn up for the weigh-in. Make the weight easy. Even in that part of my career, I made the weight quite easy. I didn't eat much though in that camp. I was always hydrated because it's always important to stay hydrated. It's your brain's got the fluid around it, the snowball fluid. If you dehydrate, it's dangerous. Um, but I did, I did quite a, quite a lot of food in that camp. Mm. But I felt great, fit and strong, mentally, mentally on it, and not thinking this is my last fight. But through the through the camp I was. But yeah, the perfect punch came for me at the end of my career, the final punch. on an amazing stage. And unfortunately for George, he was on the end of that, but he was still young and still growing and still learning. And, and look at what he went on to do. He fought Badu Jacques and then won a world title against Chudanov and had a couple of fights in between then. I mean, he finished his career on a high. Went in the Super Series, made some coin and all. Yep. Made some good bunts <laughs> in that. Bunts. I, mean, so, I yeah. want to know, Cole, <laughs> like, so, as you say, the fight the fight is the fight. You said it wasn't, it wasn't lucky because you're all permanently doing them minuscule reactions that are like become second nature from just in the gym and fight him and you you would have seen your opportunity to hit me with that right hand but as you say the likelihood of being able to hit me with a cleaner right hand I've never been hit with a right hand that clean in my whole career and I've been boxing you know, however many years at that point brilliant punch can you remember what the feeling the instant feeling was there and then and did did it did it register with you I'm finished now that's it I'm done like if, they, if you if, if, if at some point there was flickers of this is my last fight throughout camp and then you finished the fight, the punch. Can you remember how that felt? Yeah, well, when that punch landed, I can remember thinking that landed with everything because I felt it I felt it in my arm and it felt like, a, like when you hit the heavy bag and you stop on the bag and the bag's not moving or the bag's coming towards you and it just stops and jolts right down your body. That's how that punch felt. It was mm. a proper solid, landed solid. Um, you went over and I just thought, I think that's fucked him. I don't think he's getting up. Yeah, but I want 100% sure. I thought he might get up. So I'm walking back to my corner thinking the ref might be bringing us back together in a minute and I've got to go for the finish here. I've got to have to go for the finish. And I know it's tricky and it's slick, but I'm not overthinking anything. I'm just like looking, waiting, counting. When it gets to six, seven, the ref gets him up and you're a bit unsteady on your feet. I thought, fight's over. The ref waves it off. So I didn't get much time to process it. But after that, I didn't think that's it. I'm done. I'm retired. That's the end of it. Mm -hmm. Even though on the build up, it was this has been my last fight. This is my last training camp. I'm going to get through it by telling myself I'm never going to have to do this again. Mm. I just chinned you at Wembley in front of 80,000 on pay-per-view and it was like, this could be some big fights out yeah. there. There might be an easy touch for, yeah, for, for some money. free money. Who knows? And it didn't work out like that. The, the, um, the Chavez. The Chavez fight went away because he lost to a guy called Fonfara, I believe. Yep. Um, so that sort of killed that one and it was like James DeGale no you're right. he was your mandatory wasn't he because he won on the undercard that he was my mandatory just after I retired yeah. he'd, love, he'd love to go on here and say that yeah Froch vacated rather than fire me I retired because I was going to retire we had like a couple of weeks me and Rob thinking and Rob was Rob was up for me fighting but only if I was up for it and in my head I was already saying I'm retiring now I'm done mm. like but Maybe if I just and I was I went in the gym and did a couple of days training like a day of training and I was thinking oh, I'm so so slow on the bags I feel terrible. Did you? You went? Back yeah, in, I went back to the Phoenix in my amateur gym and then Rob came from Sheffield and just gave me a session on the pads and I was hitting the pads thinking 
I hate this. This is horrible. <laughs> like, this is really horrible. My elbow's a bit sore. I want to rest now. I think I could have had a year off and maybe just kept my eye on a bit and then maybe come back another fight at 37, 38 and done like a Hopkins for two years. But then it was like, what's the point? I'm not fit enough. I'm not at my best. I don't really want to do it. So, and did you get a gig on Sky pretty quick? Yeah, pretty quick. It made it easy for me yeah. because I was working for Sky straight away and um, doing something I really enjoyed, getting paid for it. I was still in the limelight a bit. I managed to get to tell Floyd Mayweather that I boxed in front of 80,000. Chopped yep. a few wood, chopped a few logs, yeah. chopped a bit of wood myself. <laughs> and he was looking at me thinking, what is this kid talking about? <laughs> what is, who's this? He's a frot. She didn't know me, actually. He went, how are you doing, frot? She was a great champion yourself. But anyway, I told him about Wembley. <laughs> and, it, and it went viral. It was all premeditated. I told Eddie Hearn what I was going to do before I did it, but it came across even better than what I wanted it to. <laughs> I sort of got carried away with it myself and lost my way with the words. I just kept on going on the tangent. <laughs> they were, didn't say anything. And Sky were thinking, move on. And I'm like, yeah. I chopped a few logs myself. Um, no, I chopped a few trees myself. Yeah. That, that was my quote. A lot of swimming. Never chopped a tree down in my life with, <laughs> without a chainsaw. Um, like like knocking these trees over with these axes. But anyway, so I had a good gig on Sky. I'd, um, I'd earned good money f- with the George Fikes. It was Wembley, 8,000, good pay-per-view. The numbers were good. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I was already thinking about retiring. I was already saying this to the last camp. Let's see what comes up. And if all of a sudden Eddie Hearn would have said, we've got a 15 million quid fight against Chavez Jr. in Las Vegas, I'm not going to turn it down, am I? Mm. But it was like Golovkin maybe, and can you make 166 or 165? And I'm like, no, I can't really lose three pounds below 12 stone. I didn't eat for a week to do one to do 12 stone last time. Now you want me to lose three more pounds, I'm going to cut my arm off. Mm. You know what I mean? So, it was, and I wasn't, I doing the odd run, but not enjoying it. I never got up once and did a run that I enjoyed in like the, the year off before I was thinking about maybe coming back. So, yeah, in my head I'd retired. And I don't think I told Rob quite quick enough that I was going to retire and I'd done. I think he read it. He sort of knew I was, but it, it got leaked in the paper. He did, he read it, which I, I feel bad about not actually having a full sit-down with Rob. But I didn't see much of him. He was so busy at the England squad. I didn't go up to the England squad after, after our fight. And it all just happened a bit like on Twitter. And I spoke to Rob. But not officially said I'm going to retire. I said I'm probably done. I'm probably not. It's not probably not going to happen. The Chavez fight nearly happened until he lost, and then Eddie Hearn couldn't couldn't put the deal together for me. Probably, but by that point, that looked like a mismatch, didn't it? It probably did. Yeah. So it then it doesn't sell as well. It's not it's, a massive fight. It's yeah. not mega. It's just a little. It's a payday fight, and at yeah. the end of your career, bit of a gimme. But anyway, made the decision to retire. Pretty, did you have a moment? Then? Pretty early on. Did you have a moment where you're like, "That's me done." Yeah, I was um, actually. Yeah, I did have a moment. Good question because um, I went for a run when Eddie said the Chavez fight might be on. He said, "But you need to find out if you want it. Cause if you do, you've got to let me know because I'm going to push forward for it." He's lost to Fonfara, but it's still a fight, and Sky will do it. We talked about money and what the money would be, and I got up on a Monday morning and I went for a run. This is even in my diary. I don't know why I didn't tell you about this. And um, I, I was running. And my Achilles tendon on my right ankle, which is always have to warm it up and I have to put weight on it and stress it out before I run, or is it just aches? And the ache never goes away. It's like a horrible ache. Um, it's not doing it now, actually. It doesn't. I don't run, though. <laughs> That's probably why. But I was running, and I would never, ever quit on a run. And whatever run it is, I never stop running because if I, if I stop running and I quit running, I've failed. And I feel like I can't win a fight if I can't even do a run. I've failed. And um, I started this run. I call it the Rocky Run, run a collie loop road. And you can pass these big... Um, like oil cylinders, and it reminds me of like Rocky Two when he's training for the for the fight with Apollo Creed, and um, that goes in my diary as the Rocky Run. And I was like a quarter of the way around it, and my ankle was hurting, my lower back was sore. I can remember my lungs hurt, like burning because I'd not done any running for a while, and I was just running, thinking, "Fuck me, I feel like an old man." And you do at the start of a camp anyway; you don't feel great. But I just started walking. I just, I just thought, I can't stop, I've got my clock, I'm on my heart rate, I'm, I don't know what minute miles I'm doing. And I started walking, I remember where I was on the loop road, going over the first brow of the hill before, or the retail park on the left. Um, and I just walked. And as I'm walking, I'm walking thinking, I've just quit. No, I've just quit the run. I've never quit on a run. It fucked as I'm, as much of a stitch I've got, as knackered as I am. And I'm running to start my, mon- my Monday morning run week, to start at the camp. To, to do my two weeks on my own before I joined up with Rob. And it was the first run at the start of the camp and I just started walking and I stretched my Achilles off and I was thinking to myself, that is it now, I'm done. Was you sad? Added. I was sad, yeah. I had tears it's in like my eyes. No, it's like got, the end of a... Yeah, when I, when I walked back, I didn't even jog back home, I walked, I walked around Stoke Bard off way, got home 
And Rachel went, what's up? What's up? You haven't fell over, have you? Because I fall over and dump my ankle. Or you, you fall over running sometimes, don't you? Fucking yeah. injure yourself. <laughs> and I went, no, no. I said, it's it's done. It's over. And I was like, literally crying. I had like tears running down my face. Not like bellowing, but I was emotional. And I got tears. I went, that's it. I'm done. It's over. And she went, give me a cuddle. And she went, oh, I'm so happy for you. She goes, you're done. Definitely now. Mm. I went, yeah, it's done. I just not didn't finish the run. Start that was a sign. There's nothing there, yeah. So, yeah, I'm glad you asked. Because mm. we spoke about you feeling like you wake up on the Monday after that, you're, you're a civilian. You f- how did you mm. feel being a civilian? Yeah, yeah. For the first time exactly. in, what, 20 years? As, as, like Since a, you were an amateur. Normal no, bloke. exactly. A, a civilised civilian. Civilised civilian. Weird. Because when, you, when feel- you're boxing, you're not civilised. feels horrible. feels horrible. You feel normal. You feel like you check your band balance and think, well, I've done all right. And it makes a big difference because if some fighters retire and they've had great fights but they've not earned the money and they've got to go back to normal life and try and start to earn a living again, that's where I can see where they get a bit mentally like disturbed and start struggling. And, um, yeah, it's always better when you've had a great career and you've made money and you've got things set up, which I have. I've got a property business and I've got a lot of rentals and I've got, I'm, I'm doing new builds. So I'm financially secure. I'm in a great position. I'm missing the boxing, never going to compete again. Don't know how I'm going to cope with that because I love boxing, I love competing. But towards the end of the career, I knew it was getting hard. I knew I'd had enough of it. I knew the desire was gone. But I've got three kids. I have two or three kids then, 2014. And she was born in 15, Penelope. So I've got two kids and one on the way. And um, yeah, next part, next chapter of the life. Put that to bed behind. Talk about fighting Jake Paul and maybe rematching whoever. And you know, if someone comes out of retirement, I think you can have me. Yeah, you'd have a look at it. But to compete and fight at world level in the professional boxing ring again. I knew after a year that was me done. It was never going to happen. Never. Mm. I was happy with the decision. You remember that feeling? <laughs> well, you sort of, your body told you that, did it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, so I'd, I'd had the, the, the roller coaster with Carl, you know, the the loss that didn't feel like a loss, and then the clinical loss, that how would you get back from that? And then you, you've had a taste of it, you know, you're on the the highest stage pay-per-view you've earned good money you can look at your bank balance but then I'm, I've never won a world title I'm back at like, square one and then I'm back in back in the dog fight back trying to pump pump it out trying to get ranked trying to do this trying to jump through hoops, trying to make people happy not knowing what's coming next how old was you in that fight at Wembley 25 I think 25 and, and you want an so old old 25 yeah. I mean you was quite no, I, was, I was 25 and two months you know and I was fresh you know what I mean I, spring I'd... chicken start of his career and been through all them experiences and done everything you'd done you know yeah. you were destined to win a world title but it must have been tough for you to no, it was, to come it, from that loss at yeah. Wembley on that stage in a rematch after having such a great first fight to then rebuild and that's why I give him credit when we do this speak because he deserves massive credit and I admire George for that because to come through what he come through and keep fighting and keep believing in himself and then go on and win a world title. It's fucking some achievement. It really is. Mm. But like Carl says when there's quit, I mean, I quit a lot of runs and then I had to find a way of, I had to run with someone basically to make sure that you get the most out of it. But after losing to Badu Jack in Vegas when no one gives a shit, it's like, the last time I boxed in a world title. In a split fight. decision. In a close yeah. fight really that I thought you'd won. And people were excited for me to be fighting on a Mayweather undercard. I'm like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> you know, I mean, last year I was selling out stadiums. This year, I mean, you're not even giving me six tickets for me, for me, me, me family to come to the fight. You know, um, yeah, lose rock bottom. You know, you want to you want to quit, and then yeah, you have to come again. Be- before between that, I fight Eddie, uh, Eddie Goodnecked, and nearly kill him, and then I become a, a parent as well. And like, as you get older, and like. This is where sympathy for Carl comes in. I'm like, man, he did all that shit with me as a dad. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, I'm like, well, that's, that's that's totally different to the mindset I was in at 24. Mm. Fucking killer. I'm a killer. Like, I'll go out on the shield. Whereas in your parent, different mentality. You know, when you've had the loss, he's had the loss against Kesler, he's had to rebuild, he's had the loss against Ward, he's had to rebuild. It's toughened him up. You know, I'm in that, that, that frame of mind now. And then I was like, yeah, after, after Eddie, he's got fucking three kids at home nearly kill him it's like that's not why I got into boxing that's not cool that's not sexy that's not interesting but I can't leave the sport yet I've got to win this world title so I knew then and there I was like oh, I've had plenty of times in my career where I've been looking at the watch going how many what's my exit strategy but now this is it I'm going to fight for the world title against Trudeau win this I can go in this tournament and earn some money and come out with 
some more good wins, um, some some more memories, hopefully some more belts. Um, I'd never really thought about legacy. Like legacy was a word that Carl was using when I was fighting him, and it was something that then I tried to pick on. Like I don't talk about legacy for you know. Um, so I'd always shied away from it and not embrace that word. Like now I've retired, and I think they got much to show for it. I'm talking about <laughs> our history and winning the world title with a fourth attempt, and like that is essentially my my legacy. But yeah, it's it's weird having that that sort of that idea of. You're never quite certain. If I'd won the tournament and they said, do you want to fight De Gale next? Like like Carl says, well, how much? <laughs> Let me know, is it? Maybe I can go again. But I I kind of thought that that would be it for me. But like Carl says, these aches and pains come in starting every every training session with aches and pains. That's what I had for my last fight as well. I dislocated my shoulder in the semis and against Chris Eubank Jr. in February and... I'm fighting now September. Callum Smith, unbeaten, fucking massive. He's six foot four. He's unbeaten. He's up for it. He's been waiting for his time. So I've got a. I'm going to spoil with that. Callum Smith is a tough fighter and he? he's a good puncher and that with that left hook counter, he can punch a little bit, can't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he called me with a check to check, and then you know it's you there. It's that's that, that's yeah. the thing. Like you know it's there, don't you? You mm. you you know what the guy's good at. He's up a light everywhere now, isn't he? Yeah, yeah just like heavyweight. I always thought he'd be that way because he's tall. Yeah, yeah. yeah good fighter. He, he must but have been tight of the weight. You was injured, weren't you, fighting him, going in that fight? Yeah. He's a good fight. I remember watching the <laughs> Urban fight in, um, in the Elia Casino with a load of lads from Nottingham and we yeah. was, was cheering you on. Eubank was my sparring partner, and but we got no loyalty to anyone. And when he was sparring Cole for my rematch, I was like, ah, oh, bastard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was a bit gutted, yeah. Good Not sparring. That's how we felt it. when you went to Kessler. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I suppose maybe we had a, he played a long game, old, old uh, Eubank. Because obviously yeah, I was sparred Kessler because I was like... He's Cole not a super middleweight, is he, Eubank? He's a middleweight. He's not big enough for super middleweight. He was too big for him. No, he's a quite a big middleweight, I think, but he wasn't like nowhere near as big as me at super. I wouldn't be as big as you at super middleweight. And then like there's freaks of the way, like when Callum Smith was at super middleweight, you're like, Jesus. So you won a WBA title, didn't you? Yeah, WBA. Yeah. Which you had as well. Yeah. And WBA you beat super. Kessler for that. In the, is that a proper world title, that? I'm not taking away your world title. <laughs> No, that's the one. People they, say they WBA to me, and then I'm a three-time world champ, but in, in some of the bits, I'm a four-time world champ. Because when I beat Kester, I won the WBA. But was, was it the, the regular, WBA regular belt? Or was it the super? I well, won the super because the super belt looks different. What does your belt look like? Or did they bring the super, super in after? There's the black one. I don't think... I think the super I'm one came in, sure after. came in after. I thought they created the WBA Super or at least brought it back it's a nicer looking belt the WBA to, Super to give to Kessler so that your fight with him was a unification because before then someone he beat like I don't want to say Brian McGee he beat someone for it he did beat Brian McGee yeah. for, for, a world, for the world title so yeah what well, Alan Green was it he fought him as well that was a war yeah so was, anyway. I don't know the WBA title does your belt look like mine the WBA one mine is better does yours got like Bodies embroidered on the side bits there. I don't know. Or is it just two blank plates? I I don't I don't. You should I don't know really shit. Like, it. How can you not it, know? I'm holding it, and someone else. Where is, is it? it? You must know if it's got embroidered like. No, bodies. mine ain't up on the wall. Mine's in the case under the sofa. Is it? Mine's on display. I'm it's not, nice. I've got no amateur trophies, anything, but I've got this room, like a cinema room at home, and I've got four belts middle? in the middle. I've got the British title. That's in a box in the in the in my. You got the British title. Order room. British title at the top. So you won that outright. I've got the Commonwealth. I've won that outright. You must have had to linger there, didn't you? No, listen. I had challenges straight away. I had, I had Matthew Barney, who was a nightmare. Brian McGee, great fighter. Is that the one that nearly cool. beat you, didn't he? McGee? Broke me hand in round two against McGee. Give me an hard fight, but I nearly did beat me. He ended up face first on the canvas <laughs> in round eleven. He was in a bad way, uh, but he's a he's a real real gentleman. He's a tough jail, fighter. Yeah, jail fighter. Was that the uppercut? Was that the uppercut? Uppercut, clean on the chin. Yeah. Yeah. That, that the was the before. Cole. Tony Dodson. He came with big Dodd, mean intentions. I remember, I remember he got folded off like a deck chair, a little bit like Yusuf Matt body shot round three. He swallowed it. Oh, Did he swallow he it? No, no he got. Good, we need to get him, get him on the pod. He couldn't breathe, but right of reply. But Damon Haig, fucking okay, no, hell, what a fighter he was! Great record. Let's save this. Yeah, yeah. Right, is this another, Carl, another podcast? Carl, we always have a. But the British yeah, title, the British this. title was great. Then the Commonwealth, and then the World Title. But I had so many tough fights in the British level. Brian McGee was a great learning fight. Robin Reed. Um, Charles Adamo for the Commonwealth. They was toughening up twelve rounders, hard gruelers. So when I got in with Pascal. I was a 12 round. I, if I didn't have them at that level, and you only had one with De Gale. 
It was an absolute pussy. I, I He's Charles, skillful, I but he Charles can't fuck. He did. Yeah, about ten years after Carl. Right. He could, could walk. barely walk. Yeah. Yeah. He could barely walk. But, but you beat the girl in a 12 rounder and he had another 12 rounder, but I don't think that that kind of experience is enough to get in with me. Well, that was that was certainly the well, narrative at the time, wasn't it? When it I'm fighting, like, yeah, when I'm fighting all the... And and you got caught in that one punch at Wembley and you think it could have been so different, it could have been. But all them fights, not that build-up, it kind of gets you ready for that level. It just does. Look at Mayweather. I mean, 40, what is he, 50 and 0. And he fought everyone, didn't he? Mm. You can't give Mayweather's resume any stick at all. He boxed everybody. Absolutely everybody. And he had some tough fights as well. I had one that he could have... Who was it that nearly beat him? He boxed him twice. Madonna in the first one it was close. No, not Madonna. Castillo. Madonna, Castillo. Castillo. So the first fight, you, you know, was first fight, he could have lost. Yeah, but he made sure in the rematch. But everyone's got the bogeyman, haven't they? That could have got beat. But he's fought everyone, mate. Whether you, you're like, he's got the best resume in, in boxing. Would you agree? Or would you say Sugar Ray Robinson? Yeah. <laughs> but of our sort Sadly. of era, like, he, he's boxing most world champions. But yeah, but exactly. you've got to say that there's more belts he's yeah. But, you know. but you, in your trophy collection, world level, you've got your WBA title, which is like the WBA that I beat Kessler for. I've got two WBC titles and an IBF. So, I'm Trump, so I'm your, bronze, you your bronze medal, which was the first ever medal won by, by an English 2001 boxer. Belfast World first Championship. In the world, first yeah. English boxer to win a, any medal. Yeah. And you got that in the act. Swiftly followed by David A. Ten minutes later. Yeah, but still, you're the first. Yeah, that's at home somewhere. I think it's in the, in the attic, yeah. Mm. I'm going to dig it out now after this. Yeah, you should. George, remind me again how I become an elite club member. Well, get a GGBC cap. Done. What else? Well, you could wear the hoodie. Anything else? Well, have you got a water bottle? <sighs> Anything else? You could get a print for the wall. It's cost me a fortune. Anything else? Well, this is what it takes to be elite, Deck. Does that mean I'm in the club now? Nearly. One last thing. Just hit the follow button in your podcast app. Welcome to the club, Deck. Oh, we'll have a push in the pool, mate. Bit of a quiz around your car. You're up for the quiz. I watched. I brought Bradley Walsh religiously every night on the chase. There you go. Yeah. It's like the chase. I can only get the questions right when I watch it on replay. Though. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like like the chase, but the ain't there. We're on camera, so I don't know if we can edit edit your answers in quick and right like yeah, we usually do. But not. we can do our best. We can't even show you the answers. I'm going to give you your workings today. We got here. Yeah, what's going that. on? Yeah. The first time we've done the quiz where. We, uh, so go on, George. What's it called? All right. these years. Yeah. What's going on? We 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 um. I haven't got them written down, but we 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 tossed through through names yeah there were a few good ones they were, the cobra win three show was my favorite the cobra win three show cobra win three show yeah i know that we had, to, we had to win three so we had to talk about some but it was some too, much, too much of a reverse engineer job so we've landed on go on george we got welcome to the jumble yep why have we got that car yeah i used to come into welcome to the jungle yes yeah. so we ain't we wasn't just going to try and rhyme frotch or frock because Never know what people want to call you. Yeah. They always Frank give you a different still. name, don't they? Yeah, some people Frock even stick been easy in Frotch, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Frotch. So, no. what's welcome to the jumble? So, welcome to the jumble, Carl. Right, I'm going to give you one of your favourite fighters because I know I've been on tour with you. I know who your favourite fighters yeah. are right. One from each decade, and list of three of their opponents and three years right so mm-hmm. you got to pair off the opponent with the year that your favourite fight I'm not much of a boxing historian so this ain't going to go too well don't to worry. Be honest. it's not that but hard I'm, right so I'm really if you well understand it I won't give you the example but the example was me I thought Degal Jack Chudnov and then the pairing would be 2011 15 17 so you yeah. have to pair them off right so number that's one that's an easy one yeah number one marvellous Marvin Hagler from the 80s yeah you like Hagler yeah silk pyjamas Right, Hagler fought Tommy Hearns, Alan Minter, and Roberto Duran in 1980, 83, and 85. But who did he fight from what year? Minter in 1980. Yes. Boom. Um, and then, did he fight Hearns before he fought Duran or after? I watched that bloody box set a few times. Sugar Ray Leonard. Yeah, what was the order? Thomas Hearns, Roberto Duran. Duran was some tough not one here. Um I wanna say um I wanna say Hearns and Duran. So Minter f- hang on. Minter eighty. Yeah, Minter eighty, so eighty four, eighty five. Um I reckon it was I reckon it was Duran and then Hearns. 
Yes. yes. 83, yeah. 85. Bill. Well done. Right, question yeah. two. Easy. Three out of three. Yeah. Prince Nazim Hamid. Massive, nas- massive Nazim Hamid fan. Right, Naz fought Wayne McCulloch, Steve Robinson and Kevin Kelly in 95, 97 and 98. Yeah, 95, 95 Robinson. Yeah, to win the world title, his first yeah. world title. Um, and then he would have fought... Rob McCracken did pads for um, the Pocket Rocket. Wayne McCulloch. Based in Vegas. So we, yeah. we, but yeah. we met him when we Rob did pads and then he fought Kevin Kelly in that absolute wicked fight where yep. he got dropped. In New York. Period. That would have been after that, wouldn't it? He didn't fight McCulloch after that. And I'm going, I'm going to go Robinson... Um, yeah, ninety five, and then and then I'm going to go McCulloch, ninety seven, Kelly, ninety eight. No, other way, way around. around. But Kelly was in the December, so that's a bit of a stitch up, and it was that, was it around Christmas that Kelly fight? Seem to remember. It was, it was cold. That was a wicked York. fight, Kevin. Kelly, if you've never seen that, that was a wicked fight. Amazing. So he fought McCulloch after Kelly. Yeah, did but, but yeah. shortly after, the touch him, was it? So yeah. close. Yeah. That was close. I watched every one of his fights. I was at the fight when he fought Barrera in mm-hmm. Vegas. Yeah, my last hundred dollars in my pocket, and a Mexican took it off me. Next to me, a hundred dollars. I was like, I love hundred dollars. Now see him, and then he was like losing every round. He was like, Yeah, baby, yeah, baby. You're getting beat. You're going down. I'm like, Give me back my hundred dollars. I'm skin. Lee was in the casino drinking Long Island iced teas, smoking uh, Marlboro lights, just drinking and smoking and gambling, doing all his credit card Happy on the, days, pulling yeah. cash out of the wall, doing his credit card. Oh no! <laughs> I remember when I went downstairs in the morning, about ten o'clock, of a good mate of mine, Jason. And Lee was still at the, at the casino at the roulette table. He'd been there all night. So he hadn't run out of money. And it yet. was like nine o'clock or ten o'clock. And he was like, nine o'clock is it? What, like night or morning? He didn't know if it was morning, oh, night. Because in the like casino, it's just like, like there's no daylight, there's yeah, no yeah, windows yeah. anywhere. Yeah. He'd, had, he'd, had, an, he'd yeah. had an all nighter right through to the early hours of the morning. And then straight through to breakfast. <laughs> did it make you feel better about buffet. losing a hundred dollars? <laughs> yeah, that hundred dollars didn't hurt as bad as this, but hundred grand. Right, another one. Yeah, yeah, go on. the next one. I've got number five three. out. Of, I've got four out of five at the moment. Yeah, that's five yeah. One of your favourite fighters, Joe Calzaghe. Yeah, right. Great in the, fighter in the noughties, Right, he fought uh, Byron Mitchell, Jeff Lacey, Richie Woodall in two thousand, two thousand three, two thousand six. Woodall in two thousand. Yes. Um, Mitchell in 2003, Lacey in 2006. Yes, easy. Bosh. That's seven out of nine. Let's move on from that worst Number good. four, <laughs> Carl Froch in the tens realm. Wal- Walnut. Walnut. You put Carl- a T on the end of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Walnut. Right, Carl, you fought some huge names of the world yeah. boxing in your career. Yeah. I know, but I'm going to take you back. So I'm not even going to let you play in the tens. Right, you've. <laughs> He put, he put him in order. Valerie Oden, what an odd fight that was. I used Valerie to, to spar with Valerie Oden at the Lennox Lewis College. And we ended, up, we ended up rolling around on the floor having a wrestle and like a fight, like a street fight. Rob had to jump in the ring and break us up. Why? Who started it? Well, we, we both started it because I was hammering him and his head card came off and his gum shield came out and he hit me with a shot after I'd like stopped to let him, like your head guard's off and your gum shield's out. So was, I've got to stop hitting you. And then hit with a shot. So I hit him with a shot and then he got me in the headlock. So I picked him up and did a backdrop in the middle of the ring and McCracken jumped in. That's it was so like, good. And then I boxed him. I was like, I'm boxing that nutter. He, was yeah. mad. he used to come into the into the gym with, with Jamaican flags flying around. I don't even know if he's Jamaican, but he's like, I'm sure he's Nigerian. And he used to, you know, Jamaican flag and all the like the, the weed symbols on his T-shirt. He was a proper hard nut. And I boxed him in Nottingham. I must have boxed him first. So that's got to be 2003. And then um, Commonwealth title defence against Mark Warner. He was a good fighter, he was. I went 12. No, I stopped him in the 12th or 11th. And then I boxed off after that. That's stoppage for yeah. they're all in. They're all in. Um, time. They're all in order. That's a good order. Yeah, that was a bit of a red herring. But that's another hat trick. Yeah. Hat trick. It's another win three show. Right. Your last big name. It's your favourite fighter of the. Jake Paul. Jake Paul. Right. In the 20s, right? Jake Paul was fought, according to Box Rec, Ben Askren, Nate Robinson, and. Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva is his last fight, so that's 2022. Robinson and Askren, never heard of him. Don't give a ben shit. Ben Askren, a, a, a Jake MMA Paul's an absolute Nate Robinson basketball player. Jake Paul's a clown. He's such Oof. a fucking idiot. What punts. He's not even a fighter. He shouldn't be on this list. You've disgraced this list. You put his <laughs> name on it, in fact. <laughs> That's what I think today. He just, just he don't, know, he don't know the answer. <laughs> he's sulking. I don't want to know the answer. It's disgusting know. that you've even put him on this list of boxers. Yeah, he's finally it's one disgusting. final troll. For me. Get rid of him. <laughs> he's done that on purpose, aren't he? I'm, he fume, I'm fuming. So that, was a, that was a brilliant performance, Carl. That was real. You know you're boxing good. for someone who makes yeah. out they don't know boxing. Don't quite know his YouTube. It was boxing, my era, though, wasn't it? It was. He was kind to me on that. 
Well, one of the questions was about you. Saying so, that, yeah. the, the, the first one, what my era of is 70s and 80s. Well, they the 80s, the... Um, yeah. The Hegler Hearns. And... Yeah, 80 was meant to when he won his first world title. Yeah, that fight went yeah, off, didn't it, in yeah. the ring? Yeah, the big riot. riot. Stopped on a cut, was it? Yeah, he, he got stopped on a cut. Cuts, yeah. Then, yeah, a they had bought that one, it, from Hegler. He used to get stuck in with his head. Yeah. yeah, went off in the ring. So, Cole, life after boxing. We touched on it a bit. You're obviously doing, a, doing your work for Sky, which keeps you in the sport, keeps you in the spotlight and involved, busy. Mm. Obviously, you two boys see a lot of each other at the moment anyway, because you've got your, got your tour. Yeah, we've got a little tour where we um, do a meet and greet. People get the chance, well, they, they, they have a photograph with the, the two legends of the game. Mm. <laughs> and um, What, the girls there? <laughs> <laughs> and then we... Um, we have a chat, don't we, on stage? Yeah. Talk about what a lot of what we've talked about. Now, mainly the first and the second fight, the build up to the Wembley, the, the stoppage, and then the, the knockout of Wembley and career after that a little bit. But yeah, we have a meet and greet, shake a few hands. Amazing people want to meet us. They want to have a photo with us. I, I feel honoured. I feel I think it's a privilege and a pleasure to to meet the fans that still care all this time later and still want to buy tickets, have a meal, meet me and George. Six and, month spell between the two fights as well. Yeah, Seven people, yeah exactly. It's it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And people still did. want to come yeah, and, and, and meet us and listen to us. And we have a great night and um, Mac Maker Promotions puts on a great event and um, yeah, we're on the second leg of the tour, aren't we? Yeah. Back yeah. by popular demand <laughs> this year. Do you miss boxing? Yeah, I miss boxing. I miss the competition. I miss getting in there, having a fight. And um, Do you miss it more now than before? Like, it's time past now where you're, like, oh, itching for I'm it? I'm dead realistic, and I know that the training you need to do to get in the ring and fight, and because and as soon as I start, because I still hit the bag now, I like the bag for half an hour straight through, like, a, you know, when you go on a steady jog, mm. I just go on a steady bag workout and just punch the bag, body, head, move around. When I'm tired, just get behind the jab or even just move, listen to the music. You've still got that quit you. inside you where you're like, if I quit, then... Yeah, well... I can't quit. I've got to do half hour and a no, I can't quit. I'm not bothered, like with training boxing. Like I go on a run. I I hardly ever run. I can't stand running. But I went with Rocco the other week, and um, I did a few sprints and I walk and run. I'm not bothered. If I'm playing tennis with my brother, I don't it's quit. On. Yeah, it's on. And he'll always you had a roll around after in one of those games. But like Valerio, but it's got it's got heated when he drops shots, man. And I'm running oh, the to the worst, net, man. and then yeah. I don't quite get it, and he goes boom, 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 boom and he loses the plot. And I've got to stand there looking at him. <laughs> I can be five, I can be five games up, and I'll lose the set seven, seven five because he's in my He's head. got in your head. I started head. defending that. Yeah, I've been coaching him. Yeah. <laughs> I started blocking the shots instead of going for it. I'm blocking, blocking, and then he puts it away. Seven games on the spin. So that's where you get your fix. My head goes. Compe- yeah, I haven't played tennis for a while, but yeah, table tennis, tennis, darts. We're on the arrows now in the man's shed. I mean, we get a little bit of weed in the system, but it kind of be soiled down you. Get in the zone and have a good game. Does that improve your darts? Yeah, yeah it improves everything. Improves <laughs> improves the guitar playing, improves yeah. the singing. The singing's amazing. I've got... <laughs> <laughs> What's your song? A bit of country and western. Is it? Johnny, Johnny Cash. Cash. Johnny yeah. Cash, yeah. Yeah. Well, that leaves us nicely, George, on to because we were almost <laughs> going to forget this. Oh, so yeah. don't forget the playlist in capital letters. So we ask all of our guests to give us a song for the playlist. Now, you could you could pull any song from any of your ring walks. I remember you, you came out to Oasis in Manchester, didn't you, for the first... Yeah, Eddie's, first, like, Eddie's idea. Let's win the though. Manchester crowd. It's a tune. Yeah. And then, obviously, welcome to, did, the, it worked. welcome to the Jungle. Was I'm a, not a big Liam fan, although I can appreciate that he's good and he's done what he's done, but Noel Gallagher, because the acoustic, Half the World Away and the Royal mm. Family song and his acoustic <laughs> stuff that he does, I can appreciate it. Yeah, I like, I like, I'm a big, big fan of Noel. So mm-hmm. who's your pick then for the playlist? Like, has it got to be one of my ring tunes? Nah, but no. it's just a song that resonates with you. Pete, boxers have picked ring walk songs, don't they? But it could be anything. Yeah, I'm gonna drag it back now. Yeah, go on. I'm gonna play a song that I even play now in the gym when I'm training, and it takes me back to my childhood, which ain't always great memories, and they can remind me of things for the wrong reasons. But Mark Knopfler, one of the best guitarists in the world, in a band called Die Straits, and a song called Sultans of Swing. Oh, what a tune. It's just a tune, mate. Now, that is such a good so entry. Just stick that in the Cobra yeah. playlist. Yeah, that's yeah. cool, mate. And that's the best of the lot. So I don't, I don't even know what else you got in there. Yeah. That's the best song of a lot of them. I've just smashed it with that one, haven't I? That is a proper bank. Yeah, yeah. That, is a, that is exactly what the playlist is for. Again, what a tune. Crazy on the wall, son. Yeah. And now, when people listen to this playlist in the gym, that'll come on, they'll think of you. They'll think of you, all those world title fights, all those punches, all that, all that war that you served up and I'll go I'm going to stay on this treadmill for another minute at least and I'll probably how long is how long is Dire Straits that's got to be at least a four minute yeah it's a four, four minute, minute job isn't it yeah. yeah great pick yeah well, good one yeah. that Lovely song I was just singing then by the way was another um, Oasis another Dire Straits song and that was Tunnel of Love yeah 
That wasn't Salt and the Swing that I was looking there when George thought I was going to outburst into a big song. Yeah, he's a, <laughs> he's that was a guitar in this. That was Ton of Love. You must know that one as well. Ton of Love, yeah. yeah. But yeah, Walk yeah. Alive. Walk, do, do, the Sons of Swings are one. Yeah. Do, 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 Walk Alive, that's actually Fiddy, what's his name? Not Dice Straits. Who sang that? Anyway, that's another one. Someone Which else will pick that. Which one? Walk Alive. Walk Alive, yeah. That is, that's, that's Dice Straits. Nah, Google it. It is? It's on, it? on the um, Sons of Swing album. Is it? Brothers in Arms, yeah. Is it? Walk Alive. Don't Come on. It. I thought you knew your stuff then when you had the I Spotify. Do, that's, not, that's by someone else, unless it's the, <laughs> unless the lead singer. I've got no fucking signal on you. They're going to kick us out of this studio. Because mm. we've ran right... I reckon we could have done that for another two hours. I think you can um, just clarify that. Go on. That um, Walk Alive, song by Die Straits. Walk, al- Walk Alive, Die Straits. <sighs> That's Die Straits, is it? Yeah. That's another tune. This is not the one. We could get that on the playlist. This is the one that kicks in. <laughs> yeah. Should have done that as a ring wall. I think someone. That's Dire Straits, yeah. Yeah, apparently so. Salt yeah, and Swing. You know the one, yeah. Yeah. Walk of Life was the second second hit on. Uh, so that's Walk of Life. You two Money for nothing. That. that was Darren Barker's song. Yeah. That was Darren Barker. Love that song. Yeah. We can't keep you too much longer. You literally have to go to your... No, exactly. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming. I'll make sure I listen to that really one. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah listen time. to it. We'll listen to the McGuigan one. You're I'm definitely going to get on the Bam McGuigan one. Yeah. 100%. There's the Sowell and Brothers one. You get a big mention that all yeah. about Super 6. Yeah. And then you'll be hooked. you listen to all of them. I'm already hooked. It's <laughs> a, great, a great listen. I'm part of it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Carl, thanks for having Carl, me. Carl has to drive home after these gigs. Yeah. He's listening to the same, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, if he's not talking with his brother, debating world issues and that, mm. as you say, like, he's a, he's a chilled out tennis. entertainer, isn't he? he can, if he wants to, he can, or if he wants to get in the mood for something, then it's a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. First unified champion in the club. Yes. Yeah. Big, big tick. Uh, First big, unified big, champ. Big tick. That's an honour. Who's First closing the show? Do you want me to close the show? Yeah, yes. What do you want to do? He, well, he closes the show every every weekend well, for us. It's been an absolute it's pleasure to come down to London. We're near Knightsbridge, aren't we? To um, yeah. do the George Groves Boxing Club podcast. We talked about our careers. We talked about our two epic fights. It's been a pleasure, boys. Thanks for having me on. I've been Carl Froch. This is the George Groves Boxing Club. Ooh, sign up. <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> Carl. Yeah, Carl, just give us one quote like this is the best know, podcast in, in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think he said that we could Right, there we go. We're going. Yeah.